So we'll get started. Okay. Good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to the history of art and architecture's 17th annual symposium. I'm Mark Polad. The art history majors who will be presenting tonight are all enrolled in the department's senior capstone course, which I'm teaching this quarter. In this class, students choose a paper they've written from any of their previous art history courses. They then revise, rewrite, polish them into longer research papers and into the talks that they'll give here. You'll see that in terms of their quality, they're very much like those one hears at academic conferences. But an equally important aspect of the capstone class is the discussion of foundational readings and ideas in art history. And I can tell you the level of conversation and writing by these students resembles graduate school. It's been a privilege to be in the classroom with them and I've learned a great deal. Um, the theme of this year's panels is new directions because the highly original papers we're gonna hear truly do redirect the thinking and literature on their respective topics. So I would invite you to read the students' impressive biographies in your program. Another pleasure of teaching the capstone course is that I get to hear students talk glowingly about fellow, my fellow departmental instructors. And the presentations tonight are very much a testament to their fine, dedicated teaching. And many of our colleagues are here this evening or if they're on sabbatical or traveling um, or watching on Zoom, so welcome. This, this, this evening doesn't just showcase our talented majors and engaged faculty, however, we also celebrate our department's successful alumni. And this year we are delighted to have with us Jessica Glazer, class of 2000, the new director of development at the Distinguished Renaissance Society at the University of Chicago. That's, by the way, the, the oldest and most prestigious showcase for contemporary art in the city, maybe nationwide. She'll be responding to the student talks and we'll be hearing more from her a bit later about her post-DePaul career path. Jessica graciously attended our class about a month ago and shared with us a lot of practical wisdom about foreign language, travel, museums, graduate programs. And I would invite you to, to check out her biography in the program as well. So this is how the evening will progress. Professor Cheryl Bashan will introduce the papers in the first panel. Afterwards, Jessica will respond to each with comments and questions. There will be a brief question and answer period from this audience, but not, I'm afraid, from our Zoom, our Zoom audience. Then we take a 10 minute break and return for the second panel. That's three student papers introduced by Professor Joanna Gardner Huggett. Then Jessica's responses followed by her own personal history. After that, Professor Mark Delancey will distribute the awards and say a few words of his own. Now, I have to say we are especially grateful and honored to have with us this evening DePaul University Provost, Dr. Salma Ghanem, as well as the Dean, our Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences, Dr. Guillermo Vasquez de Velasco. Thank you for being here, seriously. So terribly busy. I'd like to extend my personal thanks to our chairperson, Mark Delancey, who's been instrumental in this event and in the ongoing success of our department as has our super capable new department assistant, Eileen Corona. One change to the program, the last speaker of the evening, Matthew Steinbrecher is not with us due to medical reasons and we absolutely wish him well. Uh, can we take a second to mute our cell phones? I'm actually talking to myself when I do this. Thank you. And now before we start, the students have asked to hold a moment of silence for all those suffering in Ukraine. So can we please do that? Fantastic. 
let's begin. I'll introduce, uh, I'd like to invite to the podium, um, Laura Caroline Delara, director of the, of the DePaul Art Museum. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. Um, good evening, everyone. I am Laura Caroline Delara. I'm the director of DePaul Art Museum, and I am so pleased um, to be able to welcome everyone to our space this evening, both in person and virtually, um, to celebrate our incredible history of art and architecture students. I have had the incredibly immense pleasure of working previously and presently with a number of our presenters this evening. And I am just honored to be able to host all of you for such a momentous occasion for our students. Um, having sat in many of your shoes over the years, I know what this evening's mix of nerves and anxiety and anticipation and exhaustion can bring, but know before you even get up to this podium that this evening's event is simply a reiteration and a reassertion of the incredible work that you have done during your time at DePaul and the incredible and awe-inspiring awe work that you will continue to do um, for many years afterwards, both within and outside of the field itself. In my nearly six years at DePaul, I have been increasingly impressed with the dedication, drive, capabilities, and genuine nature of our university's history of art and architecture students. Year after year, you all continue to prove yourselves to be the precise combination of savvy, kind, and passionate art historians and colleagues that the art world needs, but doesn't always deserve. I have over the last year and a half as I've taken over my leadership role here at the museum, one of the very first emails that I sent was immediately to Mark Delancey, specifically with the intent of offering our space for this special occasion tonight. I know what this evening means for you all as students and I really wanted to help celebrate that. But I also wanted for each of you to know what this evening means for us as your museum as well. Um, the Paul Art Museum is only as strong as the future art historians, art critics, curators, administrators, artists, writers, and thinkers that we help to build, but also that help to shape who we are as a museum. What each of you brings to the podium this evening is, of course, a wealth of knowledge and research, yes. Um, but as I have witnessed it with each of you, it is also an exemplary example of what networks of care and support, kindness and encouragement for one another can bring to the arts. So I'm energized and I am hopeful for what your generation's contributions will bear. I am immensely reassured by the examples of what you've set for each other and what you've set for the rest of us. So I really thank you for allowing me to celebrate with you and to be able to share the museum space with you tonight. Um, just as a bit of housekeeping, we do ask that everyone in the audience keep your masks on while you're seated. Um, though our presenters, when you come up to the podium, you're welcome to remove your mask. So we have a little more accessibility as well. And um, if you haven't already, I also greatly encourage all of you to come back and visit us. We just opened a new exhibition last night called Remaking the Exceptional Tea, Torture, and Reparations from Chicago to Guantanamo, which absolutely would not have happened without the help of some of our students that are presenting this evening. Um, so I want to thank all of you for being here, for joining us at DPAM, for allowing me to celebrate with you. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to the illustrious Cheryl Bashan. Thank you, Laura, Caroline, and Mark. It's a pleasure to be here tonight with all of you, and especially to all of you in the first row. We're all very proud of. Um, my name is Cheryl Bichand, and I teach in the Department of History and Architecture, um, where I teach European art, pre-modern architecture, um, modern architecture classes. And then I also teach in the Museum Studies program a variety of classes. So I'm delighted to be part of uh, this evening's 17th Annual Student Symposium, and I'm delighted to be part of introducing the first panel and sets of students. So we're going to begin right away with Thomas Andrew, who will present his paper, Malian Photography, Artistic Changes in Response to Political Situations. 
His paper was written for Professor Mark Delancey's course, African Islam, Islamic Art and Architecture in Sub-Saharan Africa. All right. <clears throat> The Malian capital of Bamako is one of the fastest growing cities in Africa and has been a cultural epicenter on the continent for decades. It is currently host to the longest running photography event in Africa and is home to many leaders of contemporary photography. The medium was first introduced by, the Fran by France with the colonial conquest of the region in the late 19th century. Bamako was then transformed from a small market town into a regional economic power and the capital of governance for French Sudan now the modern Republic of Mali. The state controlled the dissemination of cameras and the production of photographs while severely limiting artistic output throughout the time of its existence. Photography being an expensive, technical and creatively underdeveloped field, it was chiefly used by the French for governance, anthropological and other non-art based purpose purposes. It was not until the 1930s when small groups of local Malians took up photography to cater to the needs of an increasingly urban population. The practice was still restricted to the upper class of French Sudanese society, but began to develop rapidly. Political independence brought forth the necessity of picture IDs and a wellspring of artistic content without French oversight or restriction. With political change and technological advancement in the field of photography, studios began to form and portrait photography grew rapidly in popularity. Artists like Saidu Kauta and Malik Sidibe worked in the 40s and 50s to create the foundations of popular West African portrait photography, a style that remains massively popular and influ influential to contemporary Malian artists. This style and artists like the two aforementioned gained local acclaim in the 1990s, sparking a rise in support for Malian photography. This sudden market growth and a period of democratization and cultural investment, all supported by then president Alpha Omari Konare, resulted in the creation of a continent-wide contemporary photography exhibition founded primarily by independent art professionals. It was titled Bamako Encounters, African Biennial of Photography, 1994. However, contemporary Malian politics, along with the now long-standing tradition of Malian art photography, uh, has spurred a change as artists work to come to terms with their Malian identity within an increasingly globalized art world. Portrait photography has lost a great deal of its popularity in Mali. Contemporary political situations such as democratization in the 1990s, multiple coup d'etats, the growth of global markets, and the creation of Bamako encounters in 1999 have all steered regional themes and techniques away from the internationally beloved tradition of portraiture to a wide range of genres and styles motivated by politics. Given the deep connection between Malian politics and Malian photography, it is certain that another drastic change is coming as a 2020 coup d'etat has placed Mali under the control of a military junta. To understand the changes in contemporary Malian photography and its political aspects, one must first be familiar with the traditions of portrait photography. Malian photography first emerged onto the world stage with the recognition of a tradition of portrait photography. Saidu Kaita and Malik Sidibe are the most notable of these pioneers and are today known as the old masters of Malian studio photography. Kaita's 1956 portrait of an unknown man, shown here on the right, is a stellar example of his style. The image represents a rapidly modernizing urban culture with distinct local cultural elements and designs. Malik Sidibe's portrait photography on the left captures the same energy of change. Sidibe was an active photographic reporter who traveled Bamako along with his apprentices in search of nightlife, weddings, surprise parties, and any event where one could find Malians together celebrating. His work, Soiree Familiale from 1966, is an exciting example of his energetic style. In the works of Kaita and Sidibe, one realizes that Malian photography has always dealt with contemporary matters such as technological advancement, cultural change, urbanization, and the aspirations of a young nation. Both artists began to experience international recognition in the early 1990s, when Western art dealers and researchers became aware of the now decades old Bamako tradition. But along with this fame came the exploitation and market-driven restriction of Malian photographic practice. Once again, 
This motivated contemporary photographers to break free of market influenced restrictions and further politicize their art. The 1990s saw the rise of a new democratic government led by President Alpha Omari Konare, who supported an explosion of cultural projects and artistic development. The academic scholar and cultural worker Konare won the first democratic elections in the nation's history after the presidential guard ousted the long ruling authoritarian Mausa Traore. As a response to the economic advantages of a developed art scene and as a way to forge a unified Malian identity, Konari supported the efforts of local artists and the French government to create the Bamako Encounters African Biennial of Photography in 1994. This corroboration between French and Malian art workers led to an increase in art infrastructure and education. Accordingly, they attempted to end overt cultural exploitation and revive Malian photography. Bamako had for years been a tourist hub as the city contained a large airport and maintained ready access to Jene, Timbuktu, Gao, and other significant Malian heritage sites. The infrastructure around Bamako was relatively new. The population was booming and the economy was growing. This made it the perfect location for Africa's first permanent international photography biennial. A positive aspect of the biennial present since its inception is that while supported by the government, the event itself is not controlled by any state organization. This has allowed for a great deal of autonomy, increased freedom of speech, and a lack of geographic limitations, allowing the whole of Africa and African diaspora to participate. However, the old vestiges of colonial power were still present in Bamako, as the biennial could and still can only function with French government support and, heavily, and a heavily westernized, western dominated market. These specific political dynamics has, have influenced the artistic output of Malian artists as photography moves further away from passive portraiture to societal critique and political activism. 2010 marked another significant turning point in Malian photography, the 50th Golden Jubilee anniversary of Mali's independence. In honor of this event, the government began to incentivize the recognition of older photographers other than Kaita and Sidibe, while simultaneously supporting new photographic methods and artists. These initiatives helped Malian, Malians reclaim, to reclaim their photographic heritage and recognize local artists outside of the Western art market's approved canon. 2012 saw Mali thrown into a political crisis as issues of sovereignty, Islamic extremism, and political instability resulted in the Asawad uprising and the coup d'etat of then President Amadou Taumane Touré. Democratic governance was eventually restored with elections held in 2013, where Ibrahim Baubakar Kaita was elected president. The biennial was reopened in 2015. The exhibition, titled Telling Time, was also its 10th anniversary. And, the Malian, and Malian photography saw a dramatic change from the biennials of the past. 2015's Telling Time was the first time a curator had been chosen from the region, and a decision was made to further support Malian artists, especially those who broke the mold of portrait photography. Lead curator B.C. Silva from Nigeria wished to broaden themes and engage local populations with local societal concerns. This was a calculated, inherently political push for better Malian representation and the diversification of the genre. Inshallah by Ababakar Traore was one work exhibited at the biennial that, enca that encapsulated the event's radical change in photographic practice that took place from the biennial's inception to its 10th anniversary. The work details with contemporary political issue. The work deals with contemporary political issues of Islamic radicalization in Mali, figurative art in Islamic society, and Islamic education. The image itself is a total departure from older trends, as the color and subjects within do not adhere to the progressive, modern, urban environment that has come to be synonymous with Malian photography. Like Kaita and Sidibe, Malian photographers are still interested in the contemporary and the future to take a far more political, political and stylistically different attitude towards the medium. Later biennials showcased artists with an increasingly alternative approach. On the left, Amstu Diallo, who heads the Association of Women Photographers of Mali, is one of a number of women artists participating in the biennial. Her work, an elderly woman crossing the street in Bamako, seen here, 
acts as a modern, modern counterpart to Malik Sidibe's on location, candid portrait photography. In this image, all of contemporary Bamako can be seen through the windows of a Sotramo, a popular minivan. One sees political posters, a mosque, modern technology, and traditional clothing. Diallo's presence as a woman in the biennial expresses a progressive trend in Malian politics of growing female representation. As just a year previously in 2015, the National Legislature of Mali enacted a law requiring 30% of its National Assembly to be composed of women. Diallo's presence is in part due to radical political changes in Mali and the politicization of photography by many local artists. 2010 marked another significant political turning point in Malian history. As a coup d'etat by Colonel Asimi Goita overthrew the government of former President Ibrahim Baobakar Keita, and a second coup removed interim President Ba Nda in 2021. Due to the impact of COVID-19 in the world and the renewed political instability of the nation, the Bamako Encounters African Biennial of Photography 2021 has been postponed until late 2022 and most likely will be again. The examination of contemporary events like periods of democratization, military conflicts and coups, the development of the art market in Mali, and the creation of Bamako Encounters reveals how the Malian photographic tradition has evolved in tandem with local political events. The contemporary style of Malian photography has evolved a great deal from its early days of portraiture into a politically and socially significant enterprise that has forged Mali and Bamako into the center of African photography. Malian photography and the biennial will change in reaction to the new political upheaval. But if Malian photographer, photographers have shown the world anything, it is their ability to create world-class, innovative art in the most challenging political environments. Thanks. Thank you, Thomas. Our second speaker is Hannah Orlando, who will present her paper, Non-Binary non Artists Combating Sexual Violence, their paper was presented and written in Professor Joanna Gardner Huggett's course, Topics on Women in Art. I just wanna provide a quick trigger warning before I begin. I will be discussing sexual assault um, in case anyone wants to step out of the room or close Zoom. My talk will be over in 10 minutes. Oh. Every 68 seconds, an American is sexually assaulted. Assault likely occurs much more frequently as many queer people are not included in these surveys or do not feel comfortable reporting. In my research paper, I will discuss photography, book art, and endurance performance pieces by non-binary artists, Zanelli Maholi, Maribel Jones, and Emma Solkowitz. These artists create political and activist artworks to disrupt the standard rape narrative and create alternative communities for survivors that are not represented in media. The stereotypical rape narrative assumes that a woman, usually white, walking alone outside at night in an unsafe area is raped by an armed stranger. She rushes to the police immediately after the assault and they catch the bad guy. But in fact, people are assaulted regardless of gender. Most survivors know their aggressors and often local authorities do little to help. Each of these artists I discuss, and we'll see their work momentarily, disrupt normative viewpoints in different ways. Maholi builds a platform for other voices, bringing attention to survivors within their own queer community. Jones disrupts the standard rape narrative by including many, often anonymous people's stories of sexual violence in their artwork. Solkowitz's artwork breaks the silence that sexual violence often perpetuates. As non-binary individuals, these artists are accustomed to cycles of disruption and creation. Queerness seemingly disrupts heteronormative society, but queerness more importantly creates an alternative worldview that is inclusive and community oriented. These non-binary artists 
are not only disrupting standard rape narratives, they're, correct, they're creating spaces where sexual violence can be openly discussed. Previous scholarship, or the lack thereof, has not acknowledged these artists' queer existence, nor been conducive to their community building. Non-binary people have always existed and have always been excluded from art historical scholarship. The term gender queer emerged in the 1990s, but there's evidence of genders outside the binary dating back to 2000 BCE. Individuals identifying as two-spirited also have a long history in indigenous cultures. However, art historical scholarship has failed to consider these artists. When discussing artworks about sexual violence, art historians tend to solely focus on women artists. Gender non-conforming narratives are excluded and or erased. And this is often perpetuated by authors misgendering artists. By examining these non-binary artists, I'm suggesting a need for art history that can include them. Maholi, who uses they them pronouns, is a South African visual activist artist. They began photography as a self-healing process from personal troubles, which they don't share the nature of, and discovered photography as a means of articulation. They learned that they could use photography as an outlet to share emotions and experiences and dedicated their work to portraying Black LGBTQ plus experiences in South Africa. In 2006, they founded Inkin Iso, an online initiative that produces visual histories and artistic trainings by and for LGBTQ plus people and artists. Maholi stresses the term participant in their artwork, maintaining the process as collaborative. Many writers minimize the roles of their participants and the collective nature of how they create their work. However, Maholi is committed to including their participants in storytelling, involving others in every aspect of the photography process. In 2002, Maholi began documenting survivors of hate crimes and recording their stories in the series, Only Half the Picture. Shockingly, it's estimated that almost half of all South African women will be raped during their lifetime. Many members of Maholi's community are survivors of corrective rape, the homophobic targeted rape of lesbian women, in which rapists believe they're turning the person heterosexual or enforcing conformity to gender stereotypes. Maholi's series is intimate, sharing close-up views of survivors' bodies, including their scars, as well as comforting moments and moments of tenderness. Maholi began an ongoing series, Faces and Phases, in 2006, that has more than 200 portraits of lesbians, non-gender conformative people, and trans men. Unlike only half the picture, participants of Faces and Phases look directly into the camera. Maholi started this series to create a visual history of those often marginalized in South Africa. Many of these participants are survivors of corrective rape and share their personal stories in Maholi's exhibition catalog. Maholi works to create a positive visual narrative of their community, forging awareness and creating dialogue through images. Jones, who also uses they them pronouns, is a transdisciplinary artist who established Art Against Assault, a grassroots organization that gives survivors a platform for creating artwork and racist awareness for survivors resources in 2011 after being sexually assaulted in graduate school. The limited past scholarship on Jones speaks to the erasure that many non-binary people experience. In my research, many articles discussing their artworks point to dead links and the articles available for examination misgender them. Because Jones receives less publicity, they encounter more difficulties re reaching wider audiences. However, by displaying art on the smaller, more local scale, by making books for library collections and performing in local gallery windows, Jones can reach everyday passersby to share various survivors' accounts. In 2014, Jones creating created Jarring Three, artist books to break the silence, a set of three handmade books that share the stories of 22 sexual assault and rape survivors. They dedicated a long period of time to promoting the books, gaining funding, communicating with and involving rape crisis centers, and physically creating each book themselves. Jones broke the story into three parts, 
how the incident began as shown on the left, short words or phrases concerning the assault above right and reflections on the assault below right. Each portion of the narrative takes on a different form. The last page of every book is left blank for readers to leave their own stories or responses. Jones wanted to make the set of books an archival source accessible to the public. They created 50 books and for each sold, one was donated to a rape crisis center. Making archival resources engaged with social organizations allowed Jones to solidify these narratives and historic records and share them with people who really need it. 109 Seconds, Invisible Wave was an endurance performance by Jones in 2016. The title references the 2016 statistic that every 109 seconds, someone in the US will be assaulted. Every 109 seconds, a stone was hung on the artist. During the performance, 165 survivors accounts of sexual assault played over the speakers. People who were assaulted as children, queer individuals, and people of color shared stories of their assault and ended with, with the words of strength for other survivors. No two stories shared were the same and most did not fit the narrative accepted by society. They are complicated and rarely end with justice for survivors. The performance was carried out in the window of the ATA gallery in San Francisco for over six hours until Jones collapsed from the weight of the stones. In a later account of the performance, Jones described that the emotional pain of the survivors' stories begun to outweigh the physical toll of the rocks hanging from their bodies. Jones included a handmade notebook so viewers could leave any thoughts on the performance, similar to how they left space for viewers to contribute and comment in their jarring series. By sharing a variety of accounts, Jones demonstrates that all survivors' narratives are valid and need to be seen and heard. Sokowitz, who uses she, they pronouns, also is a performance artist and anti-rape activist. They created the highly publicized endurance piece, Mattress Performance, Carry That Weight, as their senior thesis at Columbia University, after the institution's mishandling of their sexual assault claim. Out of all the artists, Sokowitz's performance is the most personal, conceptualized through their relationship with two other students who were raped by the same alleged perpetrator. Sokowitz prepared to carry a dorm mattress around Columbia's New York City campus every day until the rapist was expelled from school. He never was, and Sokowitz carried the mattress through graduation. They chose to use a dorm tw tw twin mattress like the one they were raped on because it was easy enough to carry throughout the day, but heavy enough to continuously struggle with, representing the everyday burden survivors of sexual assault are forced to carry. By publicizing their assault, Sokowitz simultaneously broke the silence on a universal issue. Due to the public nature of performance art, Sokowitz's project organically grew into a collective process. Students noticed Sokowitz struggling with a mattress daily and would help them carry it to their next destination. Carry That Weight inspired another Columbia student to create Carry That Weight Together, a collective community that works to bear the weight of Sokowitz's burden as well as providing other survivors of a sexual assault a symbol of support. Carry That Weight Together also organized an anti-rape rally in which hundreds of Columbia students participated on September 16, 2014. Sokowitz never expected their performance to become a campus-wide movement or to receive national attention. At the 2014 Democratic National Committee's Leadership Conference, Hillary Clinton commented that image should haunt all of us. Because of the publicity, they became known as the mattress girl. Although Sokowitz's pronouns are she, they, most scholars have ignored the they. The only writer to use they was a student journalist from American University. The art historical literature has also erased the impact of the two other survivors on Sokowitz's performance. Art history has a tendency to only accommodate singular artists in this case, the art historical record has positioned Sokowitz's artwork as a solely individual project. Although Sokowitz's intentions may have been personal, Carry That Weight had the biggest impact because of the nationwide activism it incited. All of the artists we have seen tonight have expanded the dialogue on sexual violence and their deeply personal works bring attention to their communities. 
Jones and Sokowitz's willingness to endure pain makes visible the weight that so many people are forced to carry. Jones and Maholi have both created archival resources and public initiatives to support their community. And Sokowitz's work inspired the creation of a collective community. The emphasis on these works and initiatives being accessible creates inclusion for survivors who are typically left out from discussions of sexual violence. These artists have not been provided support, but they're building inclusive communities to assist others. So it is time for art historians to assist them. The art history community must denote greater attention to non-binary artists rep to represent their work more accurately. This includes systematic use of pronouns, regardless of artist gender. As we learn and teach art history, we must be questioning how values are assigned to objects and be actively rethinking the canon, which has never included queer individuals. Thank you, Hannah. Our third speaker this evening is Hallie Blaukamp, who will present her paper, Relevance and Inclusivity in Historic House Museums and Sites, written for my own class, um, The Evolving Museum, Histories and Contemporary Challenges. In the past decade, historic house museums and sites have been scrambling for relevance and connection with the public. This is especially true in the case of young adults who historically have been difficult to reach. Even as cultural heritage tourism has been increasing, historic house museum visits have been steadily decreasing. A study done by the National Endowment for the Arts found that Americans were 50% less likely to visit, to visit a historic site in 2012 than they were in 1982. While this research is several years old, it does reflect a steady downward trend in visitation over time, a trend that has only been exacerbated by the effects of the pandemic and the limited technological resources of many historic house museums and sites. Additionally, those visiting cultural institu institutions such as historic house museums and sites do not accurately reflect the diversity of the American population. Many scholars in fields such as museum studies and public history have pointed out that this lack of engagement with the young public is caused in part by the inflexibility of historic house museums and sites, as well as the often less than welcoming atmosphere that exists for diverse groups. All this is even further hindered by the lack of resources, physical space, volunteer staff, and the meager operating budgets that many historic house museums and sites face. Due to longstanding insular and conservative practices, Many historic house museums and sites have had to address criticisms of their interpretation, authenticity, and narrative voice to remain relevant and to foster inclusivity. One more focused example of this evolving social responsibility can be seen in the ways that historic house museums and sites have or have not addressed the complete narrative of American history, specifically the realities of racism and slavery in America. As historic house museums and sites struggle to re remain relevant and attract the attention and interest of America's youth, it is imperative that they, they address multiple points of view to more accurately examine the narrative of American history, even its most painful realities. By implementing modern best practices and approaches, historic house museums and sites may establish stronger connections with their audiences and continue to operate as stewards and educators of history. A category of historic house museums and sites that is important to consider when discussing the narrative of enslaved peoples is American plantation homes. These are sites of perhaps the most explicit connection to slavery and racism in America. Yet, some historic plantation sites narrowly focus on the lives of the plantation owners and the historic architecture of the main home. Many plantation museums interpretation practices partially or even completely omit the narrative of Africans and African-Americans who were enslaved on those same grounds. To understand this phenomenon, we now turn to a specific site, the Destrian Plantation. It is the oldest documented antebellum plantation home in the lower Mississippi Valley 
and was the subject of a research project conducted in 2011 entitled Tour Guides as Creators of Empathy, the Role of Effective Inequality in Marginalizing the Enslaved at Plantation House Museums. Because historic house museums, and in the South, specifically plantation homes, depend on tourism, docents, staff, and volunteers are especially important in creating an effective visitor experience and navigating the often politically and emotionally high-stakes high topic of slavery. Tour guides serve as creators of historical empathy. The concept of historical empathy recognizes that a full understanding of the past requires people to adopt cognitively a perspective different from their own and to establish an emotional connection with historical actors from different eras and walks of life. Increasing the representation and in-depth vivid detail of slave life at plantations on tours is just one way to allow for greater historical empathy in visitors. Staff or volunteers at plantation sites are storytellers who are responsible for educating visitors through detailed imagery, personal stories, and spatial context. All these factors better facilitate an emotional inv investment in the past lives of the enslaved, in the, ensla in the past lives of the en enslaved, and allow for a deeper understanding of the historical narrative of slavery in America. Through the 2011 research study of docent-led tours at the Destrian Plantation, instances of effective inequality or the uneven way in which tourists are encouraged to invest emotionally in the planter versus the enslaved were uncovered. By including poignant personal narratives of loss, loneliness, and joy in the lives of the in the lives of the plantation owning family as the rooms of their home were toured, visitors were compelled to feel some form of empathy. Shockingly, the vocabulary and facts used by docents on the tour described the slave owners as generous and described their hardships, such as the danger of cooking on open flames in relation to the planter family instead of the slaves who were actually doing the cooking. These findings reiterated the unfortunate truth that many plantation house museums and sites fail to emphasize the fact that they served as economic enterprises that exploited slave labor and helped to establish, establish a legacy of racism in America. By contrast, the tours did not even include the personal interior living spaces of slave cabins on the property, which created less of an opportunity for visitors to feel a connection or, com or commonality with the humanity of the enslaved peoples who lived on the Destrian plantation. This study helped to reveal that tour guides such as those at the Destrian Plantation, play a very important role in telling a vivid history full of not just facts, but also emotions that engage visitors. When discussing these complex issues of questioning authority and finding an accurate, appropriate narrative voice, institutions often ask the following questions. What would possible solutions look like? What are the next steps for historic house museums and sites to take? The positive outcome of discussing the many shortcomings that exist in historic house museums and sites is that many museum studies and public history professionals are generating conversations about creative solutions on forums such as the Inclusium, the American Alliance of Museums blog, and Hyperallergic. One topic that is often examined and was discussed concerning the Destrian Plantation is the important concept of storytelling in historic house museums. Storytelling is an essential component of historical interpretation because of the inherent emotionality which uniquely resonates with audiences. By displaying innovation and engagement in programming tours and lessons and capitalizing on this emotional aspect, historic house museums may avoid irrelevance and better relate to their visitors. The storytellers or historical interpreters at historic house museums and sites are essential to helping visitors go beyond their initial assumptions and to make meaning on their own. By creating a scaffolding, staff and volunteers can provide content expertise and emotionally impactful experiences, while also highlighting different perspectives that guide visitors to making their own revelations. This strategy is appealing to house museums and sites struggling with financial limitations and looking to enact change that can be affordable and achievable, working with their existing volunteer and staff resources. Indeed, historic house museums and sites should be encouraged to reform outdated, less engaging historical interpretations and move toward reflective practice and, con and continuity for multi-generational multi audiences. Additionally, creating partnerships with community stakeholders and embracing histories of race, gender, and sexuality would allow historic house museums 
to better connect with the pulse of their community so that visitors may learn about what truly interests them. At the very least, adopting a storytelling focused approach embraces multiple points of view when interpreting the past. Another priority when considering solutions for historic house museums and sites looking to embrace inclusivity and in narrative voice is to abandon the notoriously vague non-answer that often comes up with this topic, that everything must be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. This answer offers no clear path of action. And while it is true that institutions will take varying specific steps, all routes should lead to the establishment of best practices and standards. In order to realize this goal, scholars in the field have developed a multitude of resources for Historic House Museum board members and staff to utilize. One of these resources, a technical leaflet published by the American Association for State and Local History, encourages the development of vision and mission statements, audience analyses, and marketing and advertising plans. Helpful aspects of this publication include checklists and citations of success stories for Historic House Museum staff to reference and use practically. Another resource that offers clear and direct steps is the Anarchist Guide to Historic House Museums. In this radical and critical guide written by Historic House Museum practitioners, the visitor experience is given center stage. It is informed by community engagement practices from outside the field. Techniques are offered to better develop connections with visitors through effective social media, diverse staff who speak the languages of the community, modern or innovative uses of space for community activities, the emphasis of home and historic house museums to create a welcoming atmosphere, as well as many more progressive standards prepared for integration and, in, and implementation. It is important to remember why interrogating historic house museum practices is worthwhile and necessary for museum studies and public history professionals to consider. The implementation of modern best practices and historic house museums and sites creates a welcoming, inclusive environment that invites a diverse audience. Representation remains of the utmost importance in museums of all types, and this remains true in historic house museums and sites, such as the Destrian Plantation. Furthermore, this is just one case study of many that acknowledge the need for revision in historic house museums and sites. Historic sites must continue to embrace inclusive and accurate narratives they reflect a moral obligation to present historical truth, as painful as that history may be. As we have seen here, these narratives and best practices play an integral, integral role in ensuring that historic house museum, museums and sites maintain relevance and continue to exist for the education and enjoyment of future generations. Haley. Our fourth speaker this evening is Savannah Yankman with her paper, Reproductions and Ready-Mades, Authenticity of Duchamp's Fountain, written for Mark Polad's Duchamp and Dadaism. The mass-produced urinal, Fountain, of 1917 by Marcel Duchamp is one of the most noteworthy artworks from the Dada movement of the 20th century and is inarguably one of the most recognizable of Duchamp's works. His intentions and Dada influences solidified this work as a cerebral and thought-provoking piece that challenged the definition of art and mocked high art culture. However, the debatable authorship of Fountain and the reproductions of this anti-art sculpture alter the authenticity of the aura of this work. Throughout, the, his, throughout his career, Duchamp created a series of found art objects that he exhibited as fine artworks, which he called the ready-mades. André Breton and Paul Evois, two of Duchamp's artistic contemporaries, defined ready-made artworks as an ordinary object elevated to the dignity of a work of art by, me, by the mere choice of an artist. Duchamp created 13 ready-made artworks during his career, and most notably, Fountain. This piece is an overturned, mass-produced porcelain urinal with R. Mutt, 1917, scrawled on its side. Some sources show that Duchamp and two friends, Walter Arensberg and Joseph Stella, 
purchased the Bedfordshire Bottle Urinal from J.L. Mott Ironworks in New York City, New York. Duchamp later explained that he chose to sign the work as R. Mutt as a reference to a daily cartoon strip called Mutt and Jeff. Duchamp then submitted Fountain to an exhibition hosted by the Society of Independent Artists, a group of 20 artists who sought to create an artistic institution that refuted cultural norms in the art world and sought to defy academic authority and promote more egalitarianism in art exhibitions. The show that the Society of Independent Artists hosted was promoted as an exhibition that would accept any artwork it received, but the group debated, debated the status of Fountain as an artwork or not, and did not want to exhibit the work. Eventually, they chose to include the piece in their inaugural exhibition, but kept it hidden from view behind a curtain. Duchamp credited this suppression of his artwork as his reason for leaving the board of the Society of Independent Artists. In 1950, Duchamp authorized a precise reproduction of his work for an exhibition in New York City, New York for gallerist Sidney Janis. Janis purchased a porcelain urinal, which Duchamp then signed. Between 1953 and 1964, 10 more reproductions of Fountain were created out of glazed porcelain to replicate the original work. And a signature was reproduced in black paint on the side. Overall, there have been 17 known versions of Fountain and many of the reproductions were created without ever being handled by Duchamp himself. Despite claims that Duchamp created this work without outside influence, there is now intriguing debate over whether or not he was the original creator of Fountain. Baroness Elsa von Freitag Loringhoven, a close friend of Duchamp's and fellow Dada artist and poet, has been theorized as the original creator of Fountain. The person who, or, or the person who create, or the person who provided Duchamp with the porcelain urinal. The most substantial piece of evidence that supports the claims of Loringhoven's involvement in the creation of this work comes from a letter that Duchamp wrote to his sister, Suzanne, Suzanne Duchamp in which he wrote, one of my female friends who has adopted the masculine pseudonym Richard Mutt or R. Mutt sent in a porcelain urinal as a sculpture. In this letter, Duchamp seemingly admits that the idea for the work and its submission to the Society of Independent Artists exhibition was not his alone or possibly at all. Some scholars have analyzed this statement not as an admission of Duchamp's lack of involvement in the creation of Fountain, but instead they speculate that because Duchamp wrote sent instead of made, that it is possible that the woman Duchamp is referring to in this letter may have simply provided the urinal to the artist and did not have a hand in the creation of the sculpture. However, evidence also suggests that the plumbing supply store and factory that Duchamp claimed to have purchased the urinal from, J. L. Mott Ironworks, most likely did not sell this model of urinal in 1917. Despite this evidence, it is still commonly accepted that Duchamp was the only artist involved in the creation of Fountain. Beyond the debate surrounding the creator of this artwork, the nature of this sculpture as a work of art has been dis discussed at length. The Society of Independent Artists originally rejected the artwork on the basis that it was not art and therefore did not belong in exhibitions or galleries. Many, many scholars maintain that the intention of the artist and the context in which the, artwork had the artist had created this work forces it into the category of fine art. Despite the minimal alterations Duchamp made to this work, the ways in which he chose to display and then sign it can be credited with assigning it a sort of artistic value. By placing the work on its side, Duchamp intentionally altered the discernible recognizability of this piece of plumbing ware. Walter Ahrensberg, one of the friends of Duchamp who had been involved in the creation of Fountain, noted that the work evoked imagery of a sitting Buddha or a Madonna-like figure and was part of Duchamp's desire to challenge the typical conventions of interpreting artwork during the early 20th century. Even the name of this work, Fountain, is a Dada-esque attempt to ask the viewer to interpret this sculpture in new ways, which may differ from their recognition of this work as a urinal. By labeling this work as a fountain, it implicates its status as a commonplace urinal as irrelevant. Furthermore, renowned art curator and scholar Francis M. Nauman asserted that the notion of context in relation to Duchamp's ready-mades is crucial to understanding the deeper meaning of his art. As Nauman wrote, for Duchamp, context is everything. A shovel in a hardware store is, after all, only a shovel. Place it into a museum and it is magically transformed into art." End quote. The intention and context of Duchamp's works, and especially Fountain, are integral to the aura of the works themselves. 
critic and essayist Walter Benjamin wrote at length on the subject of art and authenticity, describing the aura of an artwork as being altered by the reproduction and interpretation of the work. Benjamin defines the aura of an artwork as the spiritual uniqueness associated with the work itself. This aura can be negatively impacted based on the commodification and reproduction of specific artworks. When referring to a specific artwork's authenticity, art, historians, and scholars can be referring to two principles. First, the authenticity of a work can be attributed to the correct identification of the original artwork, artist of a work, which is somewhat debated in regards to Fountain. Second, the authenticity of a work can also refer to the expressive intentions of the author of a work and the artist, artistic authority over this intention that the artwork holds. Benjamin posited that the original version of an artwork, when examined independently of any possible reproductions, holds more, more artistic authenticity and authority than said reproductions. By changing the cultural context of a work through the means of reproduction, whether physical copies or mechanically created reproductions, the aesthetic and intellectual value of the original work is absent and most likely completely altered. Therefore, art scholars and critics must evaluate the artistic authentic authenticity of Fountain and its reproductions. Thus, it can be argued that the original intentions of the artist, the intention to test the boundaries of the rules created by the, the Society of Independent Artists and to redefine the limitations of the definition of art are not accurately encapsulated in the reproductions of Fountain. This lapse between the original intention of the, of the work and its aura and the aura of its reproduction create an inauthentic spirit that is attached to these reproductions. These reproductions, especially those created almost entirely divorced from the hand of the artist, do not hold the same artistic value as the original work. While the reproductions of this sculpture may have been created with the desire of expressing the original intention of the artist, it may be more accurate to postulate that they were created to convey the ways in which this work defied the artistic norms of the period in which it was created. In the example of the very first production of reproduction of Fountain, which was commissioned for a gallery in 1950 and authorized by Duchamp, that the, the fact that the gallery requested the work specifically creates a differing intention from the original, which was purposefully suppressed and rejected from exhibition. The authenticity of the aura of Fountain as it is potentially altered by its intention, true authorship, and even by its status as an art object or not, is a topic worthy of debate in art scholarship. Fountain is one of the most noteworthy Dadaist works, and Duchamp solidified its status as a more cerebral work through his intentions during its creation and display. As a found object and example of anti-art artwork, the aura of this work and its Authenticity makes it one of Duchamp's most valuable works of art in his entire artistic oeuvre, despite its reproductions. It can be argued that the reproductions of Fountain, despite differing slightly from the aura of the original work, still add to the value of Duchamp's ready-mades. It can also be argued that, the, that despite the uncertain origins of its authorship, the aura of the work is not altered significantly enough to devalue, to devalue the piece itself. Upon further analysis, Fountain is more than an overturned urinal hastily created for a non-juried exhibition in New York in 1917. It was and will continue to be a fountain of ideas that resonate with art critics and viewers alike. Thank you, Savannah. Our final speaker in our first panel session is Chloe Swift, who will present her paper, An Effable Interpretations, Calligraphy After Mao, written for Professor Curtis Hansman's Modern and Contemporary Arts of China course. When Mao Zedong became the leader of the Communist Party in 1949, calligraphy carried with it an unavoidable air of exclusivity. For centuries, calligraphy was used as a tool to reflect social coherence among the wealthiest and most privileged members of society. 
Calligraphy is the artful rendering of the written word, which descends from a logographic script beginning over 2000 years ago and appears in various styles and forms. While characters were initially carved into oracle bones and stone, a methodology of brushwork or schwafa, writing method, would begin in the Han Dynasty, 206 BCE to 220 AD. The practice of calligraphy over millennia would elevate mere writing into an unquestionably beautiful and expressive art form of the highest estimation. The changes imposed by Mao during the Cultural Revolution would successfully democratize and fundamentally alter the private art of calligraphy in order to suit the aspirations of political, political aspirations through language reform and relentless propaganda. In Imperial China, the literati or wenren, men of writing, were originally comprised of an elite class of landowning men who sought to cultivate and reinforce the inherent exclusivity of the art form. Through subsequent generations, these class divisions would be continually reinforced through calligraphy as training was selectively available to those descendants of these wealthy landowning families. Elegant brush strokes and skill could only be acquired through the exhaustive copying of old masters, such as Wang Zhishu, who would inspire complete awe in his viewers. The practice of writing aesthetically pleasing characters solidified within an elite class a shared identity as they could explicitly distinguish themselves from the general population by virtue of their calligraphic hand. In this manner, calligraphy proved itself to be a self-referential art form, elevated above standard character writing, whose mastery demanded the accessibility to old works of masters which were historically held in private collections. The act of writing played a central role in a self-generating cycle of authority as peasant and working class families had neither the time nor the accessibility to copy and master this art. The result of this privileged practice, such as masterpieces by Wang Zhishu, inspired mysticism, mysticism amongst a largely illiterate population whose inaccessibility to the art form only heightened its mysterious beauty. Over the course of 3,500 years, calligraphy would serve as a unifying force amongst the members of the elite class. A cultivated hand would signify a desirable combination of wealth, higher education, and social position. The association between calligraphy and the literati class is only one layer of meaning that had permeated deep into the People's Republic of China. During the Great Cultural Revolution from 1966 to 1976, the nature and understanding of calligraphy would be fundamentally altered. Mao Zedong, born in 1893, was at the forefront of this calligraphic revolution in his attempts to consolidate his power through systematic democratization of language and the active reappropriation of calligraphy for propaganda. Significantly, Mao had a deeply personal relationship to calligraphy, whose messages ran counter to his publicized messages towards democratization. Mao, in his relatively peasant, comfortable peasant upbringing, developed a personal fondness to the elegant characters and continued to carry this devotion of copying old masters throughout the length of his lifetime. Mao's first wife, He Zhishen, was likewise an avid calligrapher and the pair retained a close relationship due to their mutual infatuation with the art. Additionally, Mao frequently worked to strengthen his brushwork and his technique, especially during periods of high stress as it was an active pastime and also a way of strengthening the mind and body while retaining tranquility. Mao had amassed a significant amount of money selling his writings, which he used to fund his collection of calligraphy and ancient books. Thus, it is altogether unsurprising, yet deeply ironic, that Mao would not share with his fellow revolutionaries this position, who vocally advocated against the art form, which was too closely intertwined with the feudalism they fought to dismantle. Mao recognized the significance of altering calligraphy's traditional past in the rebellion against four olds being old ideas, old culture, old customs, and old habits. 
as the economic and political institutions of China began to evolve, Mao witnessed certain aspirations of his revolution become stagnant. While Mao vehemently addressed class inequality with the supposedly neutral ground of calligraphy, it became obvious that there was a sharp division in who would practice it. In 1949, over 80% of the population of China was illiterate. And not only was it a source of national shame and humiliation, but it was also understood that language reforms were a critical next step to effectively alter Chinese society. The communist aspirations of industrialization were greatly impeded by the striking mass illiteracy. It became evident that to enact lasting changes, a language that could be understood by the masses must be developed. By 1956, the newly established Language Reform Committee would propose 515 simplified characters. According to the government's plan, by limiting the number of brushstrokes per character, the intention was to develop a system of language that would be faster to write and would equalize the population. By 1964, a total of 2,236 simplified characters were published. The systematic emphasis on mass education through writing reformation would soon prove to be fruitful. Throughout the course of these language reforms, and despite outwardly promoting egalitarian ideals, Mao remained a vain poet and calligrapher. Between 1949 and 1959, I'm so sorry about that. Um, Mao wrote over 40 inscriptions for leading newspapers and magazines. Mao's distinctive and somewhat at times illegible grass hand or cursive style script would um, border on an iconic talismanic value. The practice of writing inscriptions to demonstrate favor, bestow loyalty, and denote patronage among members of the political elite had been well established. These inscriptions were often repetitive and banal in their content. The power of calligraphy in, in representing and standing in for its practitioner, usually a high official, is demonstrated in the systematic removal of the calligraphy of disgraced politicians or members of society who had simply fallen out of favor. As Mao knew, to remove the power and influence of an individual, it was necessary to remove all traces of their visible calligraphy. Mao instructed his army to avoid traditional literati displays of brushwork. As communists, quote, working on propaganda must consider their audience and bear in mind those who will read their articles or slogans. Otherwise, they are in effect resolving not to be read or listened to by anyone. By 1966, Mao had restructured the conventional modes of artistic production in an effort to, quote, popularize and democratize the aspirations of the Communist Party. In these big character posters, or Dai Zibao, produced by Red Guard artists, the traditional understanding of calligraphy began to accumulate entirely fresh associations. In the Dazi Bio on the right, titled Destroy the Old World, Establish the New, brightly colored red calligraphy is set against a stark white void at the upper left corner of the poster. Note that these characters retain very little of the thoughtful and enigmatic brush styles of old masters associated with the literati. Instead, they actively reimagine the possibility of a democratic and socially oriented script whose primary goal was legibility. To communicate to as wide of an audience as possible, individual and virtuoso displays of brushwork were to be avoided in favor, in favor of an unambiguous style, which did not reveal varying degrees of education. The significant proliferation of this new style of calligraphy would consistently reinforce the messages of the Communist Party. As importantly, it reshaped the way people understood calligraphy's traditional past. In 1977, the number of practicing calligraphers greatly increased as youth expressed a growing interest and enthusiasm in the art form. The language reforms implemented by the committee would begin to reach the most rural lands of China. In particular, the promotion and education of calligraphy inspired impoverished populations with the power of brush wielding. Despite the concerted effort to emphasize the functionality of these reforms, Aesthetically pleasing brushwork remained a sign of upward mobility. New publications of guides outlining and detailing 
proper brush technique proliferated amongst the masses. Inexpensive materials such as fountainhead pens were favored over traditional brush and ink. The widespread traditional methods of brush and ink were not only unfavorable for daily use, they became valorized objects for ceremonious and solemn occasions. By the close of the Cultural Revolution, following the death of Mao, calligraphy was beginning to warrant new regulations. By 1980, the new party leaders outlawed and removed the public display of big character posters or Daisy Bao, citing the dangerous heritage they served to embody. However, calligraphy is far from being depoliticized as the population continues to search for meaning in the contested realm of language. In Xu Bing's book from the sky, 1988, the Chinese artist invented a system of calligraphy, wholly divorced from its standard linguistic and verbal meanings. The installation containing thousands of nonsensical characters actively raises questions as to the value of the written word in molding the attitudes and values of its audience. Since these forms of calligraphy so closely resemble legitimate characters, an individual fluent in Chinese would be tempted to ascribe meaning to these words supposedly devoid of substance. In attempting to design a quote, analytical mirror of the world, Zhu Bing raised questions as to the power of the written word in developing and formulating a stable worldview. He knew that by embracing a shared past, there existed limitless potential to appropriate calligraphy to direct change and influence cultural consciousness. Through language reform and relentless propaganda, Mao would fundamentally alter the beautiful and expressive art form of calligraphy in order to unify a population. Big character posters would erase the virtuous hand of a calligrapher in order to suit the practical aim of legibility. Monumental language reforms would remove the exclusivity of calligraphy and open the possibility of a pen to be wielded by the mass population. Modern, modern artists such as Xu Bing challenged the value of calligraphy in a post-Mao era by redefining and recontextualizing the art form. The great cultural revolution brought with it a novel form of calligraphy that professes its singular power and the ability to recapture the past in order to generate an entirely modern sense of possibility. Thank you. If I could get all the speakers on that panel to, to get behind the desk and invite Jessica up for, for comments and questions. I mean, yeah, maybe up here would be wonderful. Or, or if you, maybe if you want to stand and you can face them or wherever you're comfortable. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, you know, I would be very happy. Hi, I'm Jessica Glazer. I, I finished my, it was, we didn't have an art history department <laughs> in the year 2000. I had to have an art degree and like those studio art classes were some of my worst grades in college. <laughs> I loved art history and um, I can tell you more about myself later, but that is me. And um, yeah, I, it's incredible that this is the 17th annual uh, art history undergraduate symposium because in the year 2000, we did not have a symposium. <laughs> But we had the same, some of the same excellent faculty, some of whom you see here tonight, Mark Polad and Joanna gardner Hoggett, and uh, some others who were so pivotal in like, not only my like professional and academic life, but just the personal life, my hobbies, my interests. Um, so let's talk about these incredible papers. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say what an honor to have the provost and the dean here tonight. It's so incredibly meaningful. <laughs> I hope you're impressed by the good work these students have done. I certainly am. The, the, the uh, oh, let's see. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't have words, and yet I do. Um, um, like, so you were describing the, the title of the, the sort of symposium with new directions, and I just noticed a sea change. I haven't been in graduate school in 15 years but in the way that you're all approaching 
or historical topics. I was struck by the impressive range of frameworks, topics, and approaches explored in these papers, um, much different from the, the year 2000 capstone equivalent. And our research topics were developed um, in a majority Western, European, North American geopolitical context. Two out of nine papers tonight, Thomas Andrew and Dylan Becker examine cultural production in Africa, an entire continent of dozens of nations and thousands of tribal or religious identities that were simply not part of the conversation 25 years ago. And if they were, were given short shrift. That some of these papers uh, examine cultural production outside of a fine art context to something you wouldn't have seen uh, 22 years ago. Um, Hannah Orlando and Nelly Blaukamp mark the new direction of our historical scholarship, looking at material culture, domestic <laughs> space, and personal action as channels for political messages and broader understandings of how art is defined. Likewise, um, Izzy Wagner <laughs> and Chloe Swift examine non-Western mark making and use of basic materials and collective production methods novel and interesting approach as one generally thinks of Japanese prints as having one author. Chloe also looks at the um I think it happened to your picture. Oh I just said that was me. You were an incredible oh, speaker. Oh, Let me also just say that I was really impressed by how well you presented looking at the democratization of an elite artistic practice and instrumentalizing um an elite mark to help actually a despotic leader uh, maintain control <laughs> over an enormous and diverse population. So um, a couple questions I have about uh, your work. Oh, I have more, have more to say. Speaking of the ultimate author, when we speak about Japanese, Japanese prints, Duchamp will always mark that shift from the visual to the conceptual in the early 20th century. We have two papers tonight on Duchamp. And when we look at an art museum, at a garbage can, or a simple plume of smoke, or to people kissing one another in a gallery. Um, we can trace all of that back to the origins in Duchamp, um, which Savannah and uh, Zoe uh, talked about and we'll talk about tonight. And when I worked at the Museum of Modern Art and was able to take prospective donors through, many of them just totally novices. I mean, deeply resourced people, but not a lot of understanding of art and the chronology of 20th century art history. We would start with easy stuff, impressionists, the cubists, and even futurism, and we get them into the Duchamp room and I'm like, okay guys, this is where it all changes. So let's look at this bicycle wheel, let's look at this um, shovel, and you'll be able to understand why there's like a crushed cigarette vending machine down on the first floor in a moment. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, these papers, uh, we have papers that contextualize art and the most pressing social issues today, environmental destruction and climate change, we'll get to that, sexual violence and gender identity, elevation and amplification of underrecognized narratives and more Bravo students. So um, Thomas, and I just want to say these, these these topics are just simply more relevant to yes. social issues today than the kind of esoteric stuff that I don't even know what we were talking about in the year two thousand. I don't know that I did. Um, congratulations, Thomas, on choosing such an interesting topic, one that explores cultural production in the global South, an area or concept that is not given its due by historians, researchers, and the art world writ large. It was fascinating to learn about new artists I wasn't aware of, Malik Sibide. Sibide? Yeah. Being the exception, he's a blue chip artist and showing at all the art fairs in the Chelsea Galleries in New York. I'm curious what turned you on to this topic. And I also hope you can speak further about the one image we saw of these there were three, I think, children figures and an adult figure in Islamic, most Islamic dress with black helmets. I thought this was really interesting. I hope you could speak more about sort of the meaning of those helmets and the relationship to political circumstances in 2015. And I also wonder if in your research you encountered artists who were experimenting with photography and digital manipulation. Are these all like point and shoot? 
straight up photography or people manipulate in Mali, like artists today manipulating images? And if so, what does that mean in the context of like this particular art history? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I guess I'll start with the first question. Um, yeah, I guess I just got turned on to it because I was taking part in a special science class um, on on art, and you know, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I had uh, previously written an essay focusing on Ethiopian castle design and structure and origin, and I wanted to do something a little more contemporary uh, for this next uh, class I was taking. And I thought, I don't know, I just poured through like doctor, like just tons of JSTOR. I found the one that just happened to be about this biennial that I had never heard of before. And the more I looked into it, um, it's just amazing that there's this massive annual biennial that's been going on since 1994. It's the only one, the only permanent photography exhibition that's continent wide in Africa. Um, so you don't hear about it a lot. And so I just started looking at these, you know, images from it and images from old Malio, Malian uh, studio photographers, and I, I thought it was great. I thought it was, I thought it was just something super interesting, something really new that I didn't know about. And uh, I want to talk about it because there's a lot of stuff happening in Mali right now, and it has happened in the last decade politically. And uh, I just thought there has to be a connection there. And, mm -hmm. Uh, Do you know how well attended the biennial is by the international art world? Yeah, it's um, it's it, in the francophile world, uh, you know, um, it's big, uh, especially in France. France having a ton of connection to West African countries, uh, and then in Africa, South Africa, we're talking about a continent of over a billion people right now, uh, and this is the Photography about this whole time. And so um, I, I definitely can see it getting significantly larger in the coming years. But right now, it's still fairly limited to art world people and uh, really French speaking countries in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. Um, I'm glad that you wrote in your paper. I'm glad that the cultural services of the French embassy continues to underwrite these endeavors. Right. They absolutely should in perpetuity. Yeah, they're paying for it for the most mm -hmm. part. Uh, but it, it is nice that they kind of have recently, more recently, taken a back step um, where you, you're seeing more curators from the region, mm -hmm. uh, like BC Silva from Nigeria, we're talking about. Um, and because before that, it was almost entirely, entirely French curating. Mm -hmm. like French people coming down, curating um, African exhibitions in, in another country um, that they only co own with that country. So, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's interesting, but it, it, it was getting a lot better until, you know, the country is now descended into civil war, unfortunately, not down that, but um, still, also, unfortunately. But yeah, uh, if we're talking about- uh, That Inshallah, one image with the, with the helmets. Yeah, well, the title tells us a lot about, um, and again, there's not a lot written about any of this. One, because it's so contemporary, and two, because it's Africa, and people don't write about it a lot, especially in English, so it's hard to find sources about this photography exhibition uh, or any of these artists really. But um, the title tells us a lot and the, the, the uh, images tell us a lot just about, um, uh, I talked to Professor Lansky about this too, or else I got a lot of comments from some of my friends. <laughs> 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 Um, yeah, no, I, I love this image because it's, um, it, it plays with Islamic themes of a uh, figurative representation, which traditionally in, uh, in conservative sects of Islam, uh, the figurative image is, uh, is bad, as opposed to figuratively portray uh, people invisibly, you know, that's God's, uh, a lot of God's, um, but in this image, it really plays with how has that influence affected Mali? How has it affected the culture of Mali? Uh, the education, because the three figures in front of our main figure is are, are all children. And um, Professor Delancey let me know that it is similar to a Quranic school um, teaching, like classical teaching of Quranic and Muslim. 
and the title itself, Inshallah, which is the kind of ambiguous, um, universally used term in the Islamic world. Um, it's just like reading, it's a, it's a million different things, but basically, it means like a uh, God's grace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, God, God willing. God willing, yeah. Um, and yeah, it, it's great. And the fact that it's in, the, the image is not in Monaco or any big city, it's out um, in a smaller community, kind of on a mountaintop, which is interesting. But uh, yeah, it, it's, it has a lot to say, and I'm sure a lot more to say than I don't even know. Why the habits? They're so visually yeah. striking. But, and, and one thing I, I, I learned <laughs> doing this was I got from the DePaul Library and from the Art Institute, just like a bunch of these, the, all the uh, catalogs they had for the exhibitions, mm -hmm. uh, which there's not a lot here, right. but um, <coughs> I got a couple. And the more you pour through, the more recent uh, it gets, the more you see Afrofuturism becoming a big uh, uh, style. Um, and those kind of like black space helmets uh, almost put it on like a almost like a foreign world or like a fantasy mm -hmm. world, which which kind of enhances the drama of it, uh, which 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 is wonderful, fantastic. Um, and so that Afrofuturism aspect is is a big part of it. And I talked a little bit more about that in my actual paper, um, or mention it at least. Um, and yeah, and, and as you were saying before with the digital photography, that as well is becoming a big thing. I'm seeing more and more digital manipulation, um, collage photography. New styles are really getting big. There's a lot of fun, exciting stuff happening at the Biennial, at this Biennial. So, yeah. I hope you can make it there and continue this really important work. Congratulations. Um, Hannah Orlando, non-binary artist combating sexual violence. How powerful that you started your presentation with these statistics. I wrote down myself, 81% of women, 43% of men reported sexual assault or harassment. Uh, that's a really powerful way to start your talk. Thank you for choosing a topic so important, timely. And like Thomas's paper, I'm completely outside the canon, like so many of your papers tonight. I salute also these brave artists for creating a space for dialogue about sexual violence in a world uh, where so many of the population experiences particular trauma. You are absolutely correct that our historical scholarship has failed to incorporate non-binary individuals. And I'm impressed that you are taking the opportunity here to shed light on this and expand the conversation. Um, from my vantage point, working with contemporary artists, especially in New York, um, where I just moved from two months ago, back to Chicago after 22 years, I see this changing. You see a lot more non-binary and queer artists beginning to take center stage in major cultural institutions. Um, and I think this will there would just be a ripple effect. Um, but to know that art historians such as yourself are keying into and examining this trend, which will inevitably, inevitably become a new normal, um, it's heartening. Uh, I, I was hoping you could speak about, and actually I was at Emma Skolkowitz's um, the, the evening that they did the rally around Columbia University. I lived near the university and very much in New York while she was executing that performance over time. Um, could, could you speak about, and, and, you, and I love how also at the end you answered my question, you gave us resources and you gave us those QR codes to learn more about these really important causes. Because my question was, could you speak about the afterlife of some of these projects? Is there any policy, legislation, or watchdog group development, development that stems from them? Um, I'll let you answer that and then have a note. Yeah, um, a lot of these art organizations are very grassroots. Um, so it's a lot of Uh, 
Um, I, I, when reading your paper, which I enjoyed so much, um, it led me to think of Jenny Holzer and a 1994 uh, series that she created called Lustmord, which is German for sexual murder. And if you could think of German expressionists and classics like George Gross and Otto Dix creating pictures of uh, sexual violence. Um, Jenny Holzer created this series as a response to the method of methodical rape and murder of women that occurred during the Bosnian War and featured testimonies from victims slash survivors, perpetrators, and observers spelled out in LED lights, these testimonies across uh, museums across the world um, and also across the pages of the Süddeutsche Zeitung, which is the New York Times of Germany, their uh, magazine section. And she, she had these testimonies. Um, spelled out. And then more recently, uh, Holzer in 2019 at the Guggenheim Bilbao created Thing Indescribable, a, a series also of LED text spelled out a firsthand testimony from survivors of sexual assault and rape as told to humanitarian organizations, including Save the Children and the United Nations. So Jenny Holzer, if you continue in this line of inquiry, I think she's sort of like the origin story of a lot of the, the work that we're looking at, not, not non-binary, um, but really um, early early on looking at these, these difficult subject matter and shining a light on it. Great. But this, the, the, the work she did in 1994 on the Bosnian War is super, super powerful. Yeah. And, and then to publish it in the equivalent of the New York Times Magazine in Germany, which is you know, very geographically close to Yugoslavia and Bosnia. Um, Hallie, I personally love historic museums, the Motown Museum in Detroit, the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center in Hartford, Connecticut, and in fact worked with World Monuments Fund, one of my former employers, to restore and eventually reimagine the birth home of Nina Simone in North Carolina um, in partnership with the Trust for Historic Preservation. I don't know if you went through any of their resources, but they have an incredible um, uh, senior vice president and executive director of African American Heritage Action in Brent Legs. Uh, and so, if you're con con to continue this research, it's really the Trust for Historic Preservation will be an invaluable research. They're at the forefront of preserving. Um, these historic homes and creating adaptive reuse plans for them and making them relevant, especially to diverse audiences. I was really struck by your description of, description of the Thrastan plantation and its docents who tour visitors only through the great home itself and not the slave quarter, um, recounting the imagined experiences of the planter rather than the enslaved was very shocking to me and I'm very pleased that you are in, in interrogating this approach to um, courthouse museum pedagogy. Um, uh, yeah, yes, you said, you write, tour guides such as those at the plantation play a very important role in telling a vivid story of not just facts, but also emotions that engage the visitors. Um, this reminds me of a local dilemma and debacle recently faced by a major Chicago cultural institution near and dear to us. Can anyone think of what I'm talking about? The, the mass uh, firing of the docents of the yeah. University of Chicago. Um, so there's certain, maybe sort of outmoded ways of interpreting art. And then, I mean, there are positive, I guess there are positive elements to this, but I know it caused a great deal of disruption. And from a fundraising perspective, which I'll talk to you about later, these are the women that have worked there for decades and that have the art, the art Institute in their wills with huge estate gifts 
and they just blew it. <laughs> so uh, I know the NCA, my institution, and others are like ready to seize on these gifts <laughs> drawn from their institute of Chicago, the angry ghosts. But it was an interesting, um, interesting dilemma. So were there house, historic houses or sites that you encountered in your research where you feel that interpretation and representation was done particularly well? Why and how? Yeah, so actually the Pedestrian citation has enacted a lot of change, and um, their interpretation practices today uh, look quite different. And they now do have some like specific programming and lessons that involve the play corners. Um, but another location that I explore in my longer um, essay is the Royal House in play corners, um, which struck me because. It also went through a uh, transformation of their interpretation practices. And uh, unfortunately, there was quite a bit of change in how they portray the common version of history represented um, at their site. They actually changed their name from the Royal House to the Royal House and Play Quarters. Um, yeah, and I thought that was impressive. And the literature surrounding um, that change in historical interpretation, I thought was heartening. And the discussion about how that change could be possible and how the people in the field decided to help make that happen. Okay, so it, it was all the situations evolved in there. Yeah, I think a lot of those things that was pretty interesting. Okay, that's a trust for historic preservation. Um, I love that you're reading Hyper Allergic. I don't know if the rest of you are, but this is a wonderful resource uh, for all inquisitive, critical thinking art historians and art enthusiasts, hyperallergic.com. So Savannah, while you were going through your paper, I just, I was struck again by what freaking, excuse me, what kind of class Duchamp was. I can't believe it. You know, every time, it's been a long time since I looked at Fountain, but what, 1917? That he could put this in an art gallery is just like completely it, 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 not nice, it's breathtaking. Um, I appreciated in reading your paper the very straightforward argument you set out in the first paragraph. It was like I looked at how things were written and how arguments were presented, and you said the debatable authorship of Fountain and its reproduction altered the authenticity of this work. I know at the outset what you're going to tackle in this paper, bravo. Um, I was not aware that evidence suggested that J.L. Mott manufacturer did not sell this model of Uriel in 1917. And I thought, is it possible, and Mark, maybe you would know, is it possible this is handcrafted by Duchamp? Wow. Because I look at Robert, I think about the artist Robert Gober, who's living today, who's most famous for making sinks. And I'm sure it's all, and he's like totally blue shit, like it's impossible to buy his art. Um, but uh, he's making sinks and it's a riff on Duchamp, but he carefully, meticulously handcrafts these sinks that just look like something industrial that you plug into the wall of the or institute. Um, but I do wonder, um, could Fountain have been handcrafted? Did I give you a question? <laughs> no. Oh, no, I have one for you, but it's untraditional. I don't want to run out of time. This is an untraditional question. Based on your research during this paper, are you familiar with the artist Robert Ryman? His work is selling for like $25 million. He's most famous for painting white on white. He started as a security guard at MoMA in the 50s. He just passed away about three years ago. Married a lumber heiress who just like shot his art career into the stratosphere. You know, it's about networks. That's what I told you in the class. Um, Robert Ryman is most well known for painting just white on white canvases and very popular in the 70s. Again, work is selling for $25 million. I had to do an event with Robert Ryman. Had to go over to his house to collect some slides for presentation he was giving to my donors. And he's shuffling around and he pulls out a white square envelope, put some slides in it, grab the pink highlighter and writes Ryman on the envelope and gives it back to me. I put it in my desk, I put the slides in the carousel, he did a business talk. 
I hang on to the envelope and I wonder, do I own a Robert Raymond? <laughs> <laughs> So, so, like, based on your research for this paper and everything, like, tell, me, tell me what you're thinking. How do I own a Roman or not? If you want to talk about the reproduction of these slides that we're going to, I believe that Forget the slides, I'd give them back to him. But I own a white envelope signed by him. Oh, you own mine. It's if his intention was there. The intention was to transport the slides to me. Well, yeah, that's ours. Okay. Right. Are you satisfied with that question? It wasn't very in depth, but I wanted your expert opinion. Okay. Um, Rose, wait, who? Okay. Chloe, what a wonderful speaker. You're a terrific presenter. Um, I also loved, like, you, like, when I was taking art history, it's all about visual analysis. Right. You would have someone describe one painting for half an hour and be like, look at how the gold brocade drapes so. And, <laughs> like, and th there's been no visual analysis in like most of this work. And you took a moment to describe one of the posters in a very beautiful, articulate way. And it made me nostalgic for the old art history of visual analysis. Um, again, a very clear thesis statement. Uh, the changes imposed by Mao during the Cultural Revolution would successfully democratize and fundamentally alter the private art of calligraphy to suit political aspirations, language reform, and relentless propaganda. I appreciate that you tie, uh, tied my, Mao's reforms to contemporary practice, for those of Xu Bing. Um, maybe you could say just a few words because the images didn't convey really what Xu Bing's work is about. And through my work as a fundraiser, I got to visit Xu Bing in his studio in China, where he's no longer working with calligraphy, but he's trying to sneak uh, like political messages into Chinese school painting. So he's evolving, but maybe yeah. you can talk about some of the work he did with calligraphy. Yeah, so he took these characters, which are illegible, you know. Um, illegible to a, chi a, a person illegible who speaks Chinese. Illegible you know, to a fluent speaker, to a fluent reader, um, made them up. So, but they resemble characters. And essentially, it's like this long parade of these old books, which he uses, you know, the classic techniques and tools of, of you know, traditional um, calligraphy. And you really can't see it. It's literally hanging from the sky, hanging from the rafters. There's these books you can't really get close to, and it's kind of scary to make them out. And it's, you know, his intention is to try to tease you to read it a little bit. You want to read it. You're like, okay, what is this? Like hanging, there's lights, it's what, you know, you really you can't see it. You can't make any sense out of it. And I just thought that was the most profound. That was sort of what led me to my title, the unnatural interpretation of Hansen and Reed, which I have such a nothing that he's not really ineffable. But it really, you know, it, I think Shubing is such a, I don't know if you are familiar with this land script, landscape land script, where he uses these characters and you know, a big character for a tree is, you know, presented as a tree or a character for a oh. monkey, and you can turn the sculpture for a monkey. Um, but really, I think it's to just sort of like poke fun at it almost. Like it's, yeah. it's, it is sort of like this iconic class figure, somebody that grew up during the Cultural Revolution who saw it really be misused. You know, I think I mentioned the mistrust of the word, and it's, it really is just, it's just kind of like blow back in your face of like, you want to read this, but you can't. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. Does that take away its meaning or its, you know, value? No, absolutely not. But you know, just the way that it is and the way that I know we can have a installation of it or something. <laughs> uh, they did one at the University of Pittsburgh. He visited while I was a graduate student as a direct result of my education in Japan. Um, and he had a, developed a computer program. Yeah. You, and you would stand in line and you'd say, "My name is Jessica." Yeah. And he would create what looked to any of us who don't read that script. It, it was my name, Jessica, but it yeah. looks just like script. Yeah. He, created, he generated a computer program. Yeah. And he's, he has to be very careful in China yeah. about how he conducts his career yeah. and is, is much more well known and in recognized and, outside and the US. I know, that's my dream is to see what his work is, but it's all from. Dr. Hansen, I wouldn't know anything of what I know 
really about so much <laughs> if it wasn't for for more fans. So oh, yeah, shoe bang it. I also I also wonder if you had a look at how visual imagery is propaganda. Right. I've seen Chinese propaganda, right. Mao era propaganda posters that are simply like these old workers in military without script. Um, and then you have some signs that are just script and language. Yeah. Like, do you think there were conversations happening about the efficacy given the high illiteracy rates right. of just showing images of the heroic worker versus giving you words you might not understand? Yeah. I think that's what that is mostly Bear the words of some sort of like mm. some sort of action and to really instigate the act. And I think, you know, the words are almost, they don't even really need to be there. I mean, you have you have a man plunging, he's destroying this old, old he's destroying old culture, old ideas, old traditions, and he is building a pen, but um, and it can come out of it as central. But I think, you know, just for propaganda in general, it's interesting. Does the word necessarily function yeah. as much as it as much as the it image. purports it to? Yeah, I, I think that's really interesting. I haven't thought about it that way, but um, I think I think definitely the parent of the book, and even if you can't read it, you know it's demanding you to do something. Just the way that it's written and that the, the star pony background is like it's a, it's a call to action. It's a call to, to arms essentially, and that would be pretty clear and evident. With or without his literacy, but I think the calligraphy is central to to his message and to get it out and to democratize it to let people learn. So he was, in that sense, <laughs> it, it, we can talk about <laughs> it. Later, it was, I, I can't believe that you would take this very, very elite yeah. art form and yeah. she didn't attempt to democratize it. Right. It should have been just We're getting shunted right, away, right, but I guess right. you need a language. So I know. Well, now it's like, what an impressive first half. Mark, are we ready for the break? So, I think, are we ready for a break? We'll take 10 minutes and come back for the second panel. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you for your good attention. Three great papers waiting for us. And I'll, I'll ask Professor Gardner Huggett to, to come and get us started on the the next three papers, okay? Good evening, everybody. It's an absolute pleasure to be here and to introduce the last set of papers. I'm Joanna Gardner Huggett. I'm an associate uh, professor and associate dean in the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences, and I teach uh, 20th century art and feminist art history. And I'm very honored to have taught many of the people on the panel today. The first paper will be Zoe Dalbert's Rose C'est la Vie, The Ultimate Alter Ego, which was written in Marc Polad's Duchamp and Dadaism class. Please welcome Zoe. Even even it decided to take a little break, I guess. <laughs> you have to describe all the words. <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> but I think I have it on A to B mute. So I wanted to. Oh, no, here it is. Okay, great. Thank you. I can see. Okay. <laughs> okay. Excuse the technical difficulties. <laughs> Marcel Duchamp is certainly one of the most influential and well known artists of the 20th century. He has become well known for a series of landmark modernist pieces and also for the narrative surrounding their reception, including Nude Descending a Staircase Number no. Two, which caused a massive uproar at the Armory Show in New York and Fountain which we've heard Savannah talk all about, which was submitted to the Society of Independent Artists under the pseudonym R. Mutt and was turned away on grounds that it was not actually art. These, of course, were not the only reasons the name Duchamp rings a bell, and for some, the name Rose C'est la Vie may be heard even louder. The concept of Rose C'est la Vie came to fruition in 1920. Duchamp claims making this alter ego was not something he did to change his identity, 
but in order to have two. C'est la vie would become the author of some of Duchamp's most daring work, acts, and ideas. The earliest iteration of the name Rose C'est la vie was the phrase Rose C'est la vie, where C'est la vie translates to the phrase that's life. But depending on how words are pronounced, other meanings emerge. Rose C'est la vie could mean salt of the earth. Rose C'est la vie could mean to beat life. Arrose la vie, meaning to piss on life in a more slang context. Duchamp said he chose the name Rose because it is one of the most popular female names in French at the time. But this was not the only reason. Sexual connotations emerge when looking at much of Duchamp's work, and this is especially true of his alter ego. Arrose means to make wet and sexual stimulation. Moreover, the term at the time for pornographic films was cinema rose, with the addition of the R in rose creates the reading, Ero se la vie, which means sex is life. Duchamp used his alter ego, Rose, to bring things to light that are normally concealed to the public eye by creating something so eroticized it cannot go unseen. Duchamp, of course, was not the only artist who had ever used an alter ego. The way in which Rose se la vie was used would go on to influence countless modern and contemporary artists across mediums. Joan Jonas's alter ego, Organic Honey, is a great example of the highly sexualized and obnoxiously oversimplified trope of femininity. The face of Organic Honey is a frozen doll's face embodying narcissism. Joan's work explores female archetypes, the use of disguise, and the idea of subjectivity and objectivity within art and that surround artists themselves. The alter egos change the way that art is made and received. In the case of C'est la vie, the art critics would shift their gaze and after 1920 would be putting a lens on much of Duchamp's work because of Rose C'est la vie's signature or face. Rose C'est la vie became a way for Duchamp's actions and lifestyle to become a performance piece, completely shifting the view of the modern artist into something more contemporary where the artist is no longer detached from their work but becomes their work. Artists use the idea of self-performance in the late 20th and early 21st century, no doubt taking inspiration from Rose C'est la vie. Duchamp's use of his alter ego allowed for critics to not only look at and assess his art, his identity itself also became part of his oeuvre. This shifting view of the artist is perfectly exemplified by Andy Warhol. In this picture of Andy Warhol by Chris Makos, made as a tribute to Rose C'est la vie, he is posed in a blonde wig, makeup, and a classic androgynous school uniform. Warhol's hands are gently held over his genitals as he strikes a feminine pose. Without looking at his face, he seems like a more feminine man. Moving up to the face, there's no mistaking this drag performance. Even more explicitly than in the case of Rose C'est la vie, Warhol wants this to be recognized as a drag performance rather than as a genuine concern to pass as the opposite gender. In making it obvious he is a man, he encourages the viewer to question the idea of gender, sexuality, and identity in general, and how those relate to artistic subjectivity. Both Warhol and Duchamp use themselves as performance pieces to expose the inherent subjectivity of the artist and to manipulate the reception of their work. One of the major shifts that occurred within modern art around the time of Rose la vie was the idea of reception. Modern art was and is still not easily understood by many viewers who visit traditional venues such as galleries and museums. At some point during the shift into the modern period of art, many artists concerned no longer centered the general population. There was still popular art, but high avant-garde art, avant art became something that was not easily attainable for many people who were normally able to enjoy the art of the old masters. During this period, many artists themselves were giving explanations to their art that someone who was surrounded by these ideas could comprehend, but not the everyday onlooker. This must be taken with a grain of salt, given the artist could say whatever they want to appear in a certain way. At this point, the public would have to turn to the art critics to try to understand what these abstract and often iconoclastic pieces meant. In any case, the critics become even more important part of the art. The critic and the cultural assumptions made by such critics are heavily involved in how the public image of an artist is constructed and received by the public. The role of the artist in society starting in the 20th century has shifted in such a way that the artist begins to be othered. Creations such as Rose Levy are proof that the artist is the dandy man or flaneur of the 19th century is in the past and the avant-gardist as an intellectual who is even further removed from the confines of everyday life are taking the lead. These modern artists seem to be performing, even in their own lives, as something headier and further above the works of the old masters. 
This causes a lot of disconnect between the audience and the artist, which gives room for the word of a critic to be taken at face value with perhaps less thought to the contrary than before. During the 20th century, there was a shift in art, a sort of dehumanization. Artists were starting to explore ideas that did not directly connect their feelings or emotions. These may not have been in any relation to the inner life of the artist, and there was more emphasis on formal and intellectual qualities. After this shift began, much of the population felt that they could, they could not relate to the art being shown. Art had started to shift from something beautiful to look at as if looking through a window onto a picture to something that caused confusion. This again gave critics more value. They were not only to critique the work of the artist, but also explain how and why these pieces were created. This often had to do a lot with how the artist presented themselves and why some would create alter egos, throwing off many of the assumptions a critic could make. The shift in the role of an artist as being part of the art themselves, sometimes done by creating an alter ego like Rosé La Vie, created a new lens for critics to look at the rest of their oeuvre. For Duchamp, Rosé La Vie gave a more feminine perspective to his works, especially ones that were signed by Cé La Vie herself. Duchamp's work, Belle Hélène au de Voilette from 1921, which shows Rosé La Vie on the front of a perfume bottle. This perfume bottle was from the Regaud Company of Paris and would normally show a female model breathing in with her eyes closed and the slightly tilted head to show the essence of the aphrodisiac qualities of this perfume. Duchamp uses the R that stands for Regaud and changes it to RS with an inverted R meant to implicate the viewer. It may be suggested that the perfume in a vial could represent the smell of the female genitalia and the list goes on with possible interpretations of the underlying meanings of sex. Rosa Levy is not the only model for this piece, not only the model for this piece, but the author as well. Duchamp was using his alter ego to allow a work of his to become gendered in a way completely different than it would have been if a man had signed it. This creation of an alter ego is a way for an artist to force the critics to look at their work differently, because much of the time the opinion of the modern critics were based heavily on the actions of the artists themselves, which may not be what the artist wanted the public to see. Critics at the time were often left puzzled by the works in galleries such as Alfred Stieglitz's 291, which showcased modern works of Duchamp and many of his contemporaries. Even such well-respected as critics as Henry McBride praised these works for their originality, but saw that many other contemporary critics were left puzzled by these shows. McBride participated in a series of lectures sponsored by the Society and a Neem, founded by Catherine Dreyer, Man Ray, and Marcel Duchamp himself, aimed at promoting the understanding of modern art to the public. The critics view of the work often gave the public the wrong view of the artist and alter, alter egos were a way to combat that. This was not the only reason that artists would create alter egos, but it was a very prominent reason because of the weight the critics had on explaining modern art to the public. Rose Elevy was not the first alter ego to be created by an artist, but she may be one of the most important and influential. The rise in modern art created a platform for many artists to explore completely new modes and mediums of creation, and Duchamp did just that. Rose Lévy has been an inspiration to so many artists after her time, and her legacy continues to grow. Thanks very much, Zoe. And second, we will have Dylan Becker, the innovation who will read the innovation of traditional building technologies, looking to African vernacular architecture as inspiration for a greener future. And this was written for Mark Delancey's course, African Architecture. In a world in which the environmental health of the earth is declining at a rate which will soon be irreversible, sustainability is an increasingly pertinent issue. The rapid development of technological and industrial advancements in the past few centuries has provided us with the means to abandon the natural world in favor of and reliance on science. Many of these developments are currently necessary to support a population which is larger than ever and only increasing. 
but there are several aspects of modern life which can be reevaluated to ease the human impact on the environment. One of the most impactful ways to accomplish this is by adapting the buildings we inhabit. Of course, there are technologies like solar panels and geothermal systems, which help soften the blow of modern humanity on the struggling earth, but these all seem to be implemented as afterthoughts, especially when considering the, the environmental impact of the building materials themselves. Instead of developing more products and eco-friendly systems to sell, inspiration for greener architecture can be found in that of traditional pre-colonial Africa. The architecture of Africa and much of the world in general is traditionally earth-based. There are various techniques that are employed in the construction of these homes and structures, and not one of, the, one of them is excessively disruptive of the natural world. In fact, they even harness the properties of the earth to create perfectly comfortable and sufficient residences. Another application of this ideology, biomimicry, um, which is technologies based on those of the natural world, can also benefit architectural sustainability. If humans are dedicated to minimizing our increasingly damaging impact on the earth, architects and builders should look to the earth and architecture of traditional Africa for inspiration. A truly green future can be achieved at the symbiotic intersection of vernacular African building techniques and natural technologies with modern design and innovations. While the contemporary Western human has gotten used to the sterile industrial structures that surround them, it hasn't always been that way. In traditional Africa, their homes are often built in perfect harmony with their surroundings. The walls are made of the local mud and the roofs are composed of the nearby grasses. There is no aspect of African architecture which is in direct opposition to and in defiance of the natural environment. Historically disregarded as architecture, the, the building techniques of traditional Africa are actually quite advanced and well-managed. Structures built using these methods, such as puddled mud, sun-dried bricks, or rammed earth, are, with the proper maintenance, quite durable. A testament to the strength of structures made with traditional African techniques can be found in the, wall, the original walls of the ancient city of Baghdad. Founded in 762 AD, the walls of the city were constructed of mud brick and while they are no longer around today, they remained standing at least partially for over a millennium until they were completely and deliberately destroyed in the late 1800s. Aside from remaining upright, as buildings are expected to do, there are numerous other aspects of traditional African architecture which prove beneficial. A major advantage of earthen homes is the entirely organic temperature regulation of the interior. The thick mud walls absorb the heat of the day, storing it inside themselves, and then release it during the night. Because of these naturally occurring thermal properties of the earth, the buildings made of it would typically be just as clim climatically comfortable as a standard Western home. Additionally, earth is non-combustible, which if used in construction, creates naturally fire resistant buildings without the need for any additional environmentally damaging materials like the ones we use in conventional buildings. These are benefits that we have unnecessarily created for our structures since they already exist in the natural world. On an environmental level, it is easy to see why earth-based architecture is overwhelmingly more eco-friendly than contemporary building materials. Earth is one of the most abundant materials in the world, needs no power source for processing, and generates no polluting emissions or waste. It is easy to use to build and repair, and at the end of its life, it can be recycled to build new structures of earth or just go back to nature. Contrastingly, I'm so sorry. There is no material more sustainable than the earth. Instead of removing part of the natural world for a structure, earth and architecture simply rearranges what was already there. Buildings made with traditional African techniques cause virtually no disruption to the ecosystem and carry no long-term impact on the earth since as scholar Alumayua Adagan observes, the process involves little or no fossil fuel and up to 30% less water is consumed when compared to other conventional walling materials. Contrastingly, in the Western countries, the construction sector consumes a large volume of natural resources and is responsible for about 50% of waste production in the European Union. In addition to this outsized waste production, a large portion of the energy humans consume is due to construction practices. When comparing clay to a selection of other more conventional building materials, one can see that among them all, clay structures consume the absolute least amount of energy during construction. According to the EPA, 
Electricity and energy produced for heating homes and businesses are the second and fourth largest producers of greenhouse gas emissions, a major contributor to global warming. By transitioning to earth-based architecture, the energy consumption associated with both constructing and inhabiting a residence would decrease significantly enough to make a major positive difference regarding the risk of climate change. While widespread adoption of entirely earthen architecture would be most beneficial in the fight for sustainability, it is unfortunately not realistic. Where the principles of traditional African architecture can really prove beneficial is in combination with modern technological developments. There are a few contemporary architects like Italian Mario Cuccinella, who recognize the potential of earth-based architecture and utilize current technologies to make it viable for the current standard of living and construction. By taking inspiration from these traditional practices and marrying them with modern comforts and technology, Cuccinella aims to create an entirely new, sustainably modern standard of construction. His firm has combined earth materials and modern technology with their recent development of tech lab. Boasting near, nearly zero emissions, this housing model is exemplary of sustainable housing. The Tecla house is 3D printed, and while 3D printing has been gaining attention as an alternate mode of construction, these structures are typically made of plastics and other synthetic materials, which are equally as pollutant as those involved in the construction of a conventional home. To counteract this, MC Architects has printed this house out of clay, mixed with a very small amount of cement to act as a stabilizer and ensure the longevity of the structure. Even though it is not pure earth, the utilization of clay and the majority of its composition ensures a method of construction whose carbon footprint is minimal enough to prove beneficial. Of course, Tecla also benefits from the previously discussed qualities of earthen architecture, including thermal regulation and an overall reduction of energy costs and usage, both during inhabitation and in construction. Unfortunately, earth is not a viable material for all contemporary buildings like skyscrapers, but inspiration for greener construction can still be taken from the natural world for applications of biomimicry. The concept of biomimicry is based on the idea that nothing in nature is a waste and can be utilized in large scale projects to negate the impacts of modern construction. For example, the Eastgate Center in Zimbabwe is exceptionally representative of this practice. Although this structure is the country's largest complex of shopping centers and offices, it uses less than 10% of the energy of a conventional building its size. That is because of its air conditioning system or rather the lack thereof. Instead of a conventional system for heating and cooling the building, the Eastgate Center regulates its temperature by way of a unique system of vents modeled after the ventilation system found in termite mounds. In the mounds, the termites open and close a series of vents at different times of the day in order to capitalize on the external temperature. Cool air is let in near the base of the mound and after cooling the interiors, expelled from openings in the top. In the Eastgate Center, the base of the building has fans which draw in cool air that then travels through vents in the ground to cool the interiors of the building and is then expelled from the top of it. The beauty of biomimicry is that there is no singular way to implement it. Obviously, this particular system of ventilation wouldn't work in a climate like Russia or Canada, but inspiration for biomimetic architecture is taken from the surrounding natural environment, meaning that in any place with living organisms, each execution of biomimicry can be tailored to any climate. If adopted on a widespread scale, biomimetic technology would help us overcome environmental issues such as the greenhouse effect, global warming, or even the ozone hole. Applying biomimetic practices to large commercial buildings or apartment complexes can dramatically reduce the emissions and energy use associated with these types of structures. The current Western method of construction is at best indifferent to the importance of nature and at worst flagrantly exploitative of it. As sustainability becomes an increasingly pressing, pressing issue, we can look towards the practices of traditional earthen architecture in Africa to reform our own methods of construction. Moving towards earth-based and nature-focused construction would help to manage our carbon footprint and lessen the negative human impact on the earth by reducing the consumption of energy and natural resources. As earthen walls are not appropriate for every structure or climate, the practice of biomimicry can help to provide similar economic and environmental benefits. Widespread adoption of architecture, which, which combines the ideologies and materials of traditional Africa 
the 21st century technological advancements would be an overwhelmingly positive step towards reaching sustainability. Why destroy the natural world for comforts and functions which are already provided to us by it? And last, but certainly not least, is Izzy Wagner, who will present works outside the Western canon, The Important of Hiroshige's Prints, which was written for my own course in the fall, Art Historical Theory and Methodology. This print, Shinano Province by Utagawa Hiroshige, is a part of a series this artist made called Famous Places in the 61 Provinces. Created in 1853, this artwork was made in Hiroshige's favorite medium, ukiyo-e woodblock printing. Hiroshige was a prolific artist who created woodblock prints that focused on landscapes and everyday life. This print depicts a mountainous landscape with fields and buildings in the forefront, referencing humanity without including figures of people. The moon is high in the sky of various shades of blue and reflects off the rice fields below. As a work outside of the Western canon, Hiroshige's The Moon Reflected displays how the application of art historical methodologies can fail certain works, especially in museum spaces. The field of art history favors methodologies such as biography and formalism over others, particularly semiotics and materiality in this case. Evaluating this work in such detail allows one to see the gaps in the scholarship surrounding specific works of art outside of what has been deemed important within the Western world. Utagawa Hiroshige was born as Ando Tokutaru in 1797 in Japan in the city of Edo, now modern Tokyo. He graduated from the Ukiyo-e Ukiyo Master Utagawa Toyohiro School at only 15 and took the name Utagawa Hiroshige to show his affiliation with the school. Around 1830 to 1832, Hiroshige accompanied a shogunate delegation along the Tokaido Highway from Edo to Kyoto. The experiences Hiroshige had during this tip, trip led him to invent an entirely new genre of prints that focused on depicting landscapes and famous places along travel routes. From then on, Hiroshige focused solely on creating landscapes and created anywhere from 5,000 to 8,000 prints. Hiroshige died in 1858, leaving behind an artistic style continued by his pupils and later influencing Western artists such as Van Gogh, Gauguin, and countless others. It is no secret that art history as a field has historically been very Western-centric, and so Asian artists such as Hiroshige have been left to the side or judged based on Western aesthetic values. Scholarship has largely ignored the context in which these works were made beyond consideration of the artist himself. Opinions have influenced facts about Hiroshige's work. With even museums placing importance on Hiroshige's influence on Western artists, one can't help but wonder if Hiroshige is seen as important because of this influence. Without Van Gogh's Bridge in the Rain, the scene on the left, clearly modeled after Hiroshige, how much would Western audiences know of, about or see of the ukiyo-e master's own sudden evening shower on the Great Bridge near Itake? These factors are important to consider in regard to understanding the Western content, context for Hiroshige's works. Materiality is important to understanding Hiroshige's ukiyo-e woodblock prints. In Asian cultures, especially in Japan, images hold power, and thus the process of making them is taken very seriously. Due to this, materials can be viewed as having a communicative function beyond what words can say. Materials can be complex and showcase different influences on the artist, such as cultural or societal power structures. In the word of art historian Petra Lombard, to focus on the materials of an artwork is to, consider, is to consider the processes of making and their associated power relations, to consider the workers, whether they are in factories, studios, or public spaces, whether they are known or anonymous, and their tools and spaces of production. 
In art history, materials have historically been sidelined as simple descriptions of media despite their ability to illuminate societal power relations and tell histories. Just as in the wider art history world, there is a lack of scholarship using this methodology in regard to Hiroshige's prints. The materials used in the process of making woodblock prints are only discussed through the lens of Hiroshige's social class. For the artist, ukiyo-e woodblock prints were a craft for the samurai class he was born into and very market-driven. Once well-established, he created work after work almost entirely through ukiyo-e and so must have felt a certain attachment to these materials of creating. Yet, scholarship focuses instead on the formal qualities of the prints or Hiroshige's life. It is important to acknowledge the materials and process of production, especially in regard to ukiyo-e prints. Creating these prints was a collaborative process that involved the artist, carver, printer, and publisher. With such an intensive process involving so many people, particularly the carvers, one can't help but wonder why only the artist and sometimes the publisher would be acknowledged for the work put in. On the prints themselves, it would be the publisher's seal and the artist's signature that appeared. In terms of Hiroshige's prints, museums such as the Art Institute of Chicago give credit to the artist alone. The museum upholds the European idea of emphasis on the individual's genius rather than the actual work that goes into creating art. The carver was hardly ever acknowledged within the work or by museums despite their importance to the process. While carver seals were occasionally included, public publishers typically wanted the prints to be uncluttered and left carvers to sneak their names in or go unacknowledged entirely. For example, in bamboo yards in Kill Bridge, seen here, the figure just left of the center holds a red lantern that has the characters Horitake on it, as seen in the detail on the right. The carver, Yokogawa Horitake, who worked on many of Hiroshige's prints, has hidden his signature within the work. It is also pertinent to examine Hiroshige and the moon reflected, utilizing a semiotic approach. This methodology is useful for discussing the context surrounding this work through time and how perceptions of it have changed. Context is not as fixed as people would like to believe. It is important to trace out how works have been interpreted different, differently as works, have con works of art are constituted by different viewers in different ways at different times and places. As these prints were so market-driven, Hiroshige was obviously trying to appeal to his Japanese audience of the time by creating prints with Japanese ideals and feelings in mind. His art does not exist apart from the Japanese climate. The artist would improvise details and leave out what he deemed unessential instead including references to history, customs, and le legends. Hiroshige's autumn unit Ishiyama, seen here, is a prime example of imagery that Japanese audiences would understand, yet Western audiences would miss. In the temple all the way to the left, that is where Murasaki Shikibu wrote her famous novel, The Tales of Genji. The poem at the top right corner reads, at Ishiyama, the moon casting light on Nekiho is no less than Atsuma and Akashi. These are references to important Japanese novels and places that evoke feelings Western audiences don't readily believe. Indeed, in Western settings, such as the Art Institute of Chicago, these references are largely ignored in favor of the artist's biography or the aesthetic values of the print. The bare minimum information about Japan and its culture has been provided to situate these works. In the Art Institute's exhibition, Fantastic Landscapes, Hokusai and Hiroshige, from July 17th to October 11th, 2021, there was little text providing context for the prints they were showing. The second paragraph of this wall text is almost entirely devoted to its European reception, stating that landscape images dominated the print market abroad as well as domestically, particularly in France, where they were collected by the Impressionist and Post-Impressionist painters. Of the text included, they chose to acknowledge these prints' influence on Impressionist and Post-Impressionist post painters rather than include more information about their Japanese context. There are a lot of gaps in scholarship surrounding Hiroshige's work, particularly in regard to the moon reflected. Most writing is either biographical or formalist based. There is also more of an emphasis on Western scholarship on these prints, despite their inherent Japanese nature. Granted, the biographical and formalist approach may be a useful method to understanding the artist's woodblock prints. However, materiality and semiotics should be utilized more to achieve a richer, more meaningful analysis of Hiroshige's work. Without any documentation from the artist himself, these methodologies can be used to piece together a more accurate understanding of Hiroshige 
It is ukiyo-e woodblock print, Shinano province, the moon reflected in the Sarashina rice fields near Mount Kodai. Art, yes, even non-Western art deserves a more careful understanding. And I would invite our, our speakers to take their place behind the, the table and Jessica to come up and offer some comments and questions. Again, wonderful job, people. Let me see, I'm going to be more focused now about my questions, a little less rambling, a little less bio later too. Um, Rose Silvey, yes, yes. Again, I'm so struck when I see the image of this man as a woman in the early 20th century. It, what a profoundly like pivotal artist he he he, he was. And then it led me thinking to about you know, when was he? When was the first iteration of Rose Silvey? 1920. And today you have people like Kanye West, Guy, and Beyonce, and Sasha Pierce, and people taking on these other alter egos a hundred years later. But you, you successfully frame your research in terms of reception, which I know was one of the aims in this class when I reviewed the syllabus, to recognize this as a framework for understanding artworks that are increasingly hard for a lay person to comprehend. And I think like as art historians, that's sort of our job moving forward is to make this very complicated, sometimes esoteric work accessible to other people. And at least as a fundraiser, that's a big part of what I do, but I think it's all of our responsibilities. Um, you write, modern artists seem to be performing even in our own everyday lives as something headier and far above the general population. This causes a lot of disconnect between the audience and the artist, which gives room for the word of the critic to be taken at face value. Do you think Duchamp had critics and interpretation in mind when he developed this alter ego? Based on your research, was Rose a critique of art criticism itself or merely an expansion of Duchamp's creative practice and personal identity? I think you could say either way. I think a lot of what does he doesn't like to explain fully, and that's kind of his thing. He's a little trickster. Um, so Rose that he could be just an extension of his sort of you know play on words that he likes to do, sort of Tom Loy, um, you know, the sugar cube that I did that was more marble and things like that. So it could just be another um, almost like a trick to confuse critics, or it could be something that he, as a white man, just can't really convey the way that he wants to. So being seen as um, Rosa would be this sort of like sexual object um, and just- Of the very, male gaze. Right, of the male gaze. Mm -hmm. um, just sort of like flips things on its head. So I think he definitely had, he knew that the critics were going to receive this differently, but I think it may have just been something he wanted to kind of throw. He wanted to throw them all. Mm -hmm. So I also wonder, I'm curious to know if you found evidence of backlash or upset that an early 20th century man would transform himself into a female. This action to me seems almost dangerously avant-garde for its time and ties into the origin story of Hannah Orlando's research. So yeah. Um, I honestly, there was definitely a little bit of backlash, but for a lot of the research that I've done, a not a ton of it has come up just because of course it has been so influential that that kind of gets pushed to the side at this point. Um, but if you look at many of the theories about the shop in his life, they're all just he's gay, he was queer, he had weird relations with his family. They kind of um, used a lot of his artworks to sort of put these very strange generalizations upon the queer population or just shop who probably was not even a part of the queer population and just um, these sort of like weird tropes about people have kind of stuck with 
Thank you. I enjoy revisiting all of this artwork, I have to say, for such a long time. Dylan Becker, your paper was, in my opinion, the best written oh. of all of them and could go directly into a publication. Um, and another paper that I like, could go directly into a publication. You have to read the paper. I was pleased to see also you're exploring the global south and Africa. Um, this paper focuses on sustainable architecture in Africa. And I wonder if you were able to, in your research, expand on this, if you were to expand on this topic, I think you laid it out so clearly, um, where would you look at next? I think here of advances being made in Colombia by architects, there's an architect in particular, Simone Velez, who works with um, native grown giant bamboo and has major architectural commissions all across Colombia. And uh, do you see this approach to sustainability adopted elsewhere in the world, North America, Europe, Asia, and what form are they taking? Yeah, so I would, I would love to expand this idea of urban buildings kind of to Southwest of America, mm. because that is like the most similar climate. Mm. Um, I would love to expand that to there and to do the Western world with that. Um, but also, the Tekla house that I mentioned, that is, that's in Italy. Mm -hmm. so yes. That is already in construction in Southern Africa. Um, can we bring it to the global north, like London and Canada? I, Obviously, the earth didn't really work, but I imagine some sort of like you know, snow mm -hmm. construction for that. Um, but obviously, mm -hmm. that's a little bit less practical. But if it's that or many things, green roofs or a step. Uh, what about 3D printing? Did you come across that as a solution in your research? You know, I think in the way that Mario Pella Architects does it, I think that could absolutely be uh, a solution of improvement. Um, the, I just read the other day actually that it took 100 hours to get the whole structure built, which is incredible. Have a look at the use of bamboo in Colombia. Yeah. I think you find it fascinating. Um, I'm just curious, what, what material are they using? Is it plastic for the 3D printing? Um, it's actually it's clay. It's I think it's 97, 99 for clay. Oh. encourage you to look at the work of World Monuments Fund. One of my past employers is doing a lot of work in different parts of Africa to restore mud brick homes and communities. Um, well done. Susie Wagner, Hiroshika, Hiroshika Prince. I want to congratulate you for looking so close to home for your subject matter. <laughs> we are, have like an embarrassment of cultural riches in Chicago. <laughs> And I love that probably a DePaul professor schlepped you down to the museum as I was schlepped down and you got to look at original um, works of art and take that as your departure point. So that's terrific. This paper gave me pause as in my own training many years ago, I consider, I do consider these prints only in the context of how they influence Western artistic practice and aesthetics. Yeah, and I really liked the sentence that you used. I like where you wrote. Opinions about this work 
have influenced the facts. I thought that was a very strong statement. So uh, if you were to rewrite the wall text and labels from the Art Institute's Fantastic Landscapes exhibition, how would you alter them? I also wonder if you were able to consult any translated Japanese sources in researching this paper, and if so, what differences could you identify vis-a-vis -vis so called Western sources? So those are the two questions. Thank you all. Maybe at this point we'll give a round of applause for our speakers. <laughs> And it would be nice to hear from Jessica something of her briefly post default past. <laughs> we still like to hear. Thank you. Jessica. Okay. Uh, my biography is that in this program, so you can read about my professional trajectory. I'll just say a few words about how I feel DePaul informed what is by a lot of measures a pretty successful career in the cultural sector. Um, Let's see, like I grew up totally middle class in the Western suburbs and Paul was, I think I applied to the theater program and it was immediately put off by like everybody in like hats and vests giving each other back rubs. And, <laughs> and I took a, and like, and, and I ended up in an art history course um, taught by Simone Zorowski. And there was theater in the classroom. I mean, this is a woman who was absolutely passionate about the subject matter. and I modeled my handwriting off of her for years and years until it now is degenerating completely. But I took a class my junior year, uh, and art history was the class, the, the courses I was getting the best grades in. So that became my major. I thought, you know, this is the road to success, um, all A minuses. Um, but I took a class my junior year called Art and the Holocaust. And this is the class that taught me to think critically. I think all of you have demonstrated how well you can think critically about difficult, complex issues. But for me, like, I never really questioned anything around me um, until this professor, the first day of class, and talking about like cultural policy in the Third Reich, put up a picture of Monticello and put up a picture of Albert Speer, Hitler's favorite architect's um, projected Great Hall for the People. Both neoclassical structures, and he explained to us one is uh, a design by Hitler's favorite architect, one is Monticello. What do you guys think? And we were like, well, this one represents democracy and freedom and so and so. And this one is about despotism and fascism. And he said, you could just see from how it's stripped down and it's very gray. And he let us, he let us go. And then he said, these were both built by slave labor. And let's talk, let's take a really critical look at every sort of art, artistic production. And he would, he would show us television commercials about Wrigley's gum and stop it in five second intervals to show us how we're being manipulated through words and images every day and taught me how to think critically and ask questions. So um, I am so 
grateful to Simone Zerowski for her like incredible enthusiasm and passion and Paul Jaskat for teaching me where Germany is on a map. The yeah. Deutschland is not the Netherlands, it's Germany. <laughs> and, and, that, and then that's what led me actually, I was so inspired by that course and his teaching that I moved to Berlin for three years after graduation. I taught English to East German business people at the, you know, 10 years after the end of the Cold War. So they were all like having to teach English, like learn English late in life from like this American 20 year old or whatever. Um, but in learning about like when they would talk about, uh, I'm very interested in nation building through, in, through industrial design and household mm -hmm. objects. And like a lot of you guys are, we're looking at, you know, uh, material culture rather than these high art objects. So like my PhD dissertation when I started it was about plastic egg cups, um, uh, cups and saucers served on East German trains, porcelain production, connection to the Bauhaus in East Germany. Uh, but so I spent three years in Germany, was inspired by these stories East Germans were telling me about like how they related to their plastic cars and their crappy objects and thinking there must be something more to this. So, you know, West Germans talk about East German products being created on the, the chopping block, not the design board. And I thought there must be more to this. So I, I went to graduate school with the help of Paul Jaskot, who ended up being on my PhD committee and helped write a wonderful letter of recommendation to get me to a PhD program. I made it for, for four years before I realized I couldn't go through the dissertation. I needed to earn more money from the professor. <laughs> and uh, at 30 years old, um, a professor at that time, you know, I, I don't know. But I was looking down the barrel of like a very bad job market in like 2007. So my friend said, my best friend who's a curator said, uh, you know, you know how to write grants for your research. So persuasive writing, which you all demonstrated profoundly important in anything you're going to do. You can write, you can write grant applications to get money for your research, but East Germany, which is like a tough sell. Let me tell you, like, let, let me, like, why don't you give me money to study eat plastic in East Germany? Um, and I did it. So she said, you could, so I wrote, you know, I, uh, and she said, and, you, and you've been teaching our history classes at the University of Pittsburgh. You can talk about art and make it accessible to people. Every museum has a department called development where they do fundraising. You might be a good fit there. And just through luck and relentless networking, I, uh, that's a, sort of launched my career. But DePaul gave me confidence. Um, I was recognized my junior year for winning a, it was a horrible paper, it was horrible. I, I would read it on moth as like a joke, uh, but, but I did win a prize for it at DePaul. Um, and I won a $200 gift certificate for with, with which I framed uh, an Anselm Kiefer poster that I still have in my apartment 22 years later. I won this Lenore Pressman prize. I don't even know if they did that for the best art history paper. And that just gave me confidence I wasn't the most talented, but I certainly was passionate. And uh, opportunity, I worked at the art gallery, I worked in the art department, I worked as a research assistant, and I worked as a student curator, and I think as like head of the like, art history club or something like that, while I was working full-time at Starbucks to support myself in school. The warmth and like just continuity of the relationships I've had, Paul Jaskot stayed on my uh, PhD committee, I stayed in touch with Mark, Johanna through Facebook. Last night I was at the opening of Bibiana Suarez, one of the studio teachers at DePaul and the brilliant printmaking professor I had, Mark Slotkowski. Uh, he was there at the opening. And just these, these relationships I've had now for decades, these people who are so nurturing, so warm, so smart. So I appreciate that warm support opportunity and the confidence given to me uh, by DePaul. So Aylin, thank you for all that you did to make this possible. Mark for inviting me and the DePaul leadership. It's amazing to have you here and congrats students. Like I'm so excited about this next generation. So uh, that's my bit, right? <laughs> Hi. 
Hi, so uh, I'm Mark Delancey. I'm a professor in uh, history of art and architecture. I focus on African and Islamic art history. And I'm chair of the department. And uh, wow, such great papers. I could listen to these all night. So what do you think we start again from the beginning? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, uh, so it's the, the 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 time of the evening when I uh, have the opportunity to give prizes out. Um, so I'm going to give uh, present the prizes, uh, and then I have some comments at the end uh, to to sort of finish out the night. Um, but Eileen, I think, has all of the prizes. Oh. Yeah. I'll just take them. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, of course, first, uh, we have a, a prize for our moderator, uh, uh, who uh, is our distinguished uh, or outstanding alumna. So we have a nice award. And a stipend, yeah. Yeah, so thank you for, for you know, talking to, our, talking to our students in class and giving, giving them advice and, and, uh, and moderating tonight. Much appreciated. Uh, we have two paper prizes. It used to be only one prize, I think, but we have two paper prizes now. We have prizes for the best paper written in the capstone course, which Mark Poe led. Uh, taught and you heard all of the presentations this evening from. And then we have the uh, non-capstone paper prize as well. So let me get so let me start with the um, capstone prize. So the uh, winning uh, prize for the best paper written for the capstone class uh, goes to Hannah Orlando. And our runner-up prize goes to Thomas Andrew. And for the non-capstone prize, this is this may kind of give you the giggles a little bit, uh, but the uh, non-capstone prize um, goes to a Thomas Andrew for. The paper you did not hear this evening, but a paper entitled Santa Costanza, the evolution from Roman burial monuments to Christian mausolea. And uh, the uh, runner up or honorable mention uh, prize uh, goes to uh, Hannah Orlando. <laughs> Uh, actually, uh, 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 Amy Sal, challenging post-colonial patriarchal structures. And and now I have certificates for all of our speakers because you're all rock stars. Uh, Thomas. Your participation in tonight's event, Dylan Becker. I think these are in alphabetical order. Let's see. Ali Blanco. <clears throat> Zoe Calver. Savannah Yonkman. Whoops. Uh, Hannah Orlando. I didn't know you had four names. <laughs> I'll just keep it to two. <laughs> Chloe Swift. And Izzy Wagner. Thank you.
But now I have a few closing uh, comments. So um, I think there's a lot of thanks to go around this evening, but I wanna start, it's kind of weird at the end of the evening to do this, but I wanna start with a welcome. Um, and for somebody who's not here. Uh, so uh, we, uh, uh, I wanna begin with the happy announcement uh, that uh, a new professor, Yun Chen Lu, uh, will be joining our department next year teaching courses in Asian art. Uh, and I think she's with us in, on, on the Zoom link. Um, Yun Chen's research focuses on Chinese painting and calligraphy uh, with a particular interest in artists with physical disabilities in pre-modern China. Uh, and when I say she's a new professor, I mean that in the double sense that we'll both be welcoming her as a new faculty member, but she'll also be a, a newly minted PhD, uh, which she'll be receiving from UC Santa Barbara. So um, a, a welcome to, to Yun Chen. And then the thanks, lots of thanks, lots of people to thank. Uh, first of all, Laura, Laura Caroline for, uh, you know, reaching out to us uh, about the possibility of having this event here. Um, it's, it's wonderful to, to be having our symposium in the museum. Um, rather than in another, yet another classroom. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, you know, uh, the museum um, provides uh, formation for our students as much as our classes do. Uh, and so um, this is a, 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 a part of our, what we do as well. Um, and, and, and it's also wonderful to be having it in person. I mean, we still can't have the long table, buffet table over there with the food and the drinks and all that good stuff, um, but at least to be holding our symposium in person again uh, is wonderful. Although I gotta say, I feel a little naked without my mask on. <laughs> um, so thank you, Laura Carolyn. Uh, thanks to Jessica uh, again. Um, Thanks to Mark Polad for teaching the course, preparing our students so well, um, so helping them uh, figure out how to present these things, but also perfect their papers. So thanks to you. And, and also thanks to all the professors, various professors who um, took time outside of their normal teaching responsibilities to to work with students and help them prep their papers and their, their presentations. Thanks to Eileen, um, who has helped all, with all the technical, practical, I mean, if this event works tonight, it's because of her, right? So, so thank you, Eileen. And of course, thanks to all the, the family and friends and so on who are either here or watching online, supporting our students. Um, thanks to uh, Dean uh, Vasquez de Velasco and Provost uh, Ranim for, for coming. And, and, and I, I hope you, you see the wonderful hard work that our students are doing here. Um, it's been an honor uh, to have you all here. And most of all, thanks to our students for putting in some long hours. You, you, make, you make us look good uh, and we're proud of you. So thank you much. Thank you all for coming. I hope you had a great evening. Thank you.